2018. Um, there is something that we can start talking about uh, while they're preparing to start the conference, because I'm going to be the first and I will start talking about <laughs> a smooth start. Um, and because uh, I would like to uh, understand uh, what kind of uh, learners you are working with mostly, like which age groups you are mostly interested in, uh, we can focus more on kids, like from 6 to 10, 11. Um, we can talk more about younger teenagers. Uh, this is 11, 12. Or more about teenagers, like 13, 17, or maybe adults. So uh, can you please just write one word uh, in the chat, like which age group you are mostly interested in? You can write the word all if you're interested in everyone. But if you help me focus, that would be very useful. Uh -huh, adults. Uh -huh, sorry, I, I see that some of you wrote about small kids. I, I, unfortunately, I don't work with kids uh, who are preschoolers, but six plus, I do. So uh, I hope I'll, it'll be useful. Uh, teenagers, all, primary. Mm -hmm. So we have very diverse groups. So, okay, I'll try to talk about the main principles that could be applicable for everyone then. And of course, remember that you're allowed and encouraged to ask questions in the chat. I'll try to react um, as soon as possible. And actually, we can start the conference now. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for keeping you waiting. We had some technical issues, but now everything is fine. I hope everyone will enjoy today's uh meeting today's event. My name is Julia Czorna. Uh, I'm a marketing specialist at Great Education Center, uh, Kyiv, Ukraine. And uh, this is our third traditional event for English teachers, Great Teacher Talks. Uh, thank you very much, Lida, for uh, for entertaining and for welcoming the participants today while we were fixing some uh, things that needed to be uh, fixed. Um, so actually, Great Teacher Talks is the traditional event that we hold uh, two or three times a year for English teachers. And um, it's a great honor for me uh, and for Great Education Center to have so many uh, ELT professionals with us today. And uh, could you please type in the chat box if you can hear as well? Okay. All right. Good. Um, so more than a thousand teachers from Ukraine and abroad are uh, participating in uh, today's event. And uh, many of them are watching us live, uh, not only in Zoom, uh, but also on Facebook uh, and YouTube and Telegram. So greetings to everyone. Uh, if you are watching us elsewhere, not in Zoom, you can also type where you are now. And those of you who are here in Zoom, please uh, let me know uh, which city you are in and probably which country you are in now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lithuania, Kyiv, Cherkasy, Ternopil. Oh, this is my hometown. Uh, Rome, Italy, Scotland, Albania. Wow, so many, so many teachers, so many active participants with us today. Great. So now when we know the geography of our event, um, let me tell you more about what to expect today. So... Uh, we are going to have three wonderful sessions with three amazing speakers from, and they are experts from a great uh, education center. All of them work as teacher trainers and teachers, and they are eager to share their best practices and experience with you. And the school year is just around the corner, so we decided to talk about things that will come in handy for any teacher who works at public or private schools and especially for those who would like to gain new knowledge and skills and apply them in their classroom straight away. Are there many teachers who would like to gain some new knowledge and skills today? Let me know in the chat box. Yeah, okay, great. 
That's great. Uh, all right. So <clears throat> I believe that most of you uh, are constant learners and love what you do. And so do we here at Great Education Center. And we are sure that everyone needs confidence, a confidence boost from time to time, whether you are a new teacher or have been grace in classrooms for years, especially when you meet new challenges. Um, the education landscape shifts and you find uh, that you need to make some changes to your teaching practice and uh, especially at the beginning of the new school year. So um, today, the first session was by Lydia Simak, you already know her, uh, is going to look at simple steps to how to get started smoothly and set up clear classroom routines uh, that will make the learning process clear and comfortable for both learners and teachers. And you will learn how to establish classroom routines, prevent and solve common misbehaving issues probably, create positive learning atmosphere, and quickly switch into English, yeah? Because very often our students <clears throat> don't want to speak English in the classroom and they uh, prefer to use language one, which is Ukrainian or any other language of your native country. So the next session uh, by Oksana Nazarchuk is going to discuss what stands behind the phrase understanding of meaning and how to check this understanding using concept checking questions. So if you have ever been to the CELTA course or the TKT course, um, you probably heard about this abbreviation, yeah? But if it's something new for you, um, believe me, it's a very useful uh, session because uh, we're going to discuss how to make those questions and why we need to ask them, yeah? So we will answer the most common uh, questions what do we explain first, how to form those uh, structures, what it means when we check understanding and uh, when we check understanding. And finally, the third session by Olena Bochkarova is going to share uh, some useful tips and strategies of how you can prepare your students for use of English and writing parts of B1 preliminary exam and B2 first exams for schools, which are very popular, especially now. Uh, because everyone uh, is learning English and wants to prove uh, their uh, their um, proficiency by an international certificate. And these parts of the exam are believed to be the most complicated sections. So Olena is going to talk about these parts of exams. I would kindly ask those naughty participants who are drawing on my presentation to stop doing this, please. Yeah. We are nice and well-behaved teachers here, yeah. Um, those of you who teach online, I believe they also don't like when students do so. So I would kindly ask you to not to annotate on my screen because my presentation is going to be interesting and nice, okay? Thank you very much. Let's move on. Let me remind you about the certificates because most of you would like to get them, I believe. And... Um, you will surely receive them after today's uh, three wonderful sessions. And um, they will be emailed to you together with the recording of this event. And uh, you will get this follow-up email on Monday. So please make sure that you check the spam and promotions folders because it usually drops there. And you will also receive a special gift from Great Education Center. So please, it's not a gift, it's an information. So please do check it. And um, if you have any questions about certificates, they are going, uh, they are not going to have your name there. So you have to download them and type your name uh, by yourself. All right, so let me start probably. So what does it mean teaching with confidence? Teaching with confidence is the essential ingredient in creating a great class, right? Confidence comes through building capability and capability comes through repetition and experience. Let me give you an example. Um, are there any drivers, uh, are there any people who drive a car uh, present at today's session? Let me know in the chat, please. Yeah, we have so many teachers driving cars. That's so nice. Okay, so you, you will know what I'm talking about. Okay. <clears throat> So I got my driving license uh, two years ago and I wasn't very good at driving. 
and my car used to stall when driving up the hill and I was really frightened to outdrive other cars and sometimes I failed to fit into the turn that was at the beginning and now two years later I can do those things without effort and I feel much more confident about my abilities. There are many things that I still cannot do, obviously, but I have confidence that I'll be able to do it successfully. So the confidence comes from having done it and there is no way to fake that. There is no way to be truly confident about your ability to do something that you've never done or you only done a couple of times and aren't very good at. And the confidence won't come until after you've had more experience. Obviously, the same thing is true in teaching. And the longer you've been at it, the more your confidence will grow. But there are also um, has to be some repetition. So the only way to be good at teaching is to do the same things over and over again. And the more you do something, um, the more confident you will become at it. You will remember when you did something before and it didn't work and you will be able to tweak it and you will learn um, from each experience to make it better and better. Um, great education center um, that I work for is 13 years of work and experience in ELT market of Ukraine. Great training is a team of 70 plus certified teachers and teacher trainers. And 100% of them are internationally qualified professionals with teaching qualifications such as, I Sorry. Such as CELTA, DELTA, CELP, CELTS, TKT, and other international qualifications. We offer a lot of opportunities for promotion and professional development for English teachers in Ukraine and worldwide. So if you visit our website, grade.ua, you will find that we offer one week to four months long courses, such as CELTA, DELTA, TKT, and DELTA module one preparation. Uh, we also hold uh, online workshops and webinars, uh, skill development workshops for teachers and teaching facilities. Um, the last time we also held the conference, international conference, and uh, we also hold teaching events uh, regularly, probably like twice a month. Our teacher training program, Great Teacher, is approved by the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and can be included into compulsory hours of professional uh, development. Um, maybe you are a brand new teacher or maybe you are new to your school or a grade level um, or curriculum or standards. That's the thing with education now. Uh, that is even um, that even veteran teachers feel like newbies at times because things are changing so fast. And there are so many new techniques and practices and technologies to learn that everyone put back into the beginner role many times. So our team has prepared something very, very special for you to teach with confidence. Um, can you let me know in the chat box what you think it might be? All right. Are there any ideas? Oh, secret agents. Okay, we have some people who know something. Not to be afraid of teaching a new course. Okay, any other ideas that we have here? Okay, I, I can see that some people already know, but I will ask you to keep quiet, okay? And uh, now I'm going to tell you what <clears throat> it is. All right. So a little bit of history. So we started this project just before the new year, 2022. And by that time, we've already experienced the pandemic. We conducted dozens of teacher training courses, webinars, and events for English teachers. 
And we wanted to share our experience and expertise with more and more teachers in Ukraine and around the world. We believe that innovation in education can come in different forms. And it's not just introducing new technology in the classroom. So we decided to make possible what wasn't possible before. And fortunately, we were able to maintain uh, continuity during the pandemic. Uh, we've experienced this at our center. So we innovated by offering new methods of teaching uh, knowledge transfer. So we gathered a team of enthusiastic professionals who, despite the war in Ukraine, didn't give up and wanted to support teachers in these circumstances. So we have been working days and nights and uh, under fire and sirens, and we made it. All right. Let me show you the video probably of how it was, yeah? Okay. All right, let me mute someone who is talking. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so we have created an innovative professional online self-study platform for ELT professionals, uh, which is called Great University. So we believe that our country is on the verge of a dramatic change, and so is education uh, and teachers. So now let me introduce you to our new products that will allow you to teach your students with confidence and grow as a professional. Um, what do we offer? Uh, right now, there are three categories of products available. They are short courses, credentials, and uh, video library. And let me tell you more about our short courses. So the first course is online tools, which is a course by Christopher Rees, a Delta module one, CELTA, CELP, uh, and CELP, as trainer at Great Education Center. And in this course, we look at various teaching tools for online learning, explore ways to use them for language uh, teaching. And um, of course, uh, we pay attention to teaching skills and systems online, uh, as well as classroom management. So no matter how long you have been teaching online and which tools you will finally decide to use, this course will help you to exploit your learning, uh, your teaching strengths and find the approach that's right for you your students and your teaching context. Our next course um, is on task-based learning. It's a specialized course for those who would like to deepen their knowledge and understanding of this approach. And um, it's written by Irena Avalishvili, um, uh, a teacher from Great Education Center, who is also CELTA, CELTS, and Delta qualified one. And here we look at principles behind TBL, learn more about TBL lesson frameworks, learn how to adapt course books, materials, and supplement them with TBL uh, tasks. <clears throat> Our next course is my favorite, number one, because I took IELTS exam. And if at that moment I had known about this course, I would probably have taken it, but it, it hadn't been created yet. So it's a course on teaching IELTS essays. And if you are planning to take this exam or if you are preparing your students for this exam, uh, it's the best choice for you. Uh, written by Andrei Pigarev, <clears throat> who is not only a teacher trainer, a CELTA tutor, he's also an IELTS certified trainer and international speaking examiner. And Andrei works for Education Center as an academic director. So in this course, we look at the requirements for writing IELTS essays, types of essays, how to organize ideas, how to assess uh, essays and what criteria examiners use to assess the essays, the systems of teaching IELTS essay writing, and of course, effective tasks and activities for uh, developing essay writing skills with your students. So if you are interested in teaching IELTS, I highly recommend this course. The next one, um, it's a course written by Lydia Simak, you've seen her today, and she's going to be the speaker at our event. So if you are teaching young learners or beginner levels of adults, this course is a great help. So um, it's written <clears throat> by Lida and 
We look um, here, we look as, at flashcards. It's one of the classic teaching tools, but um, it's very useful one. And we look at the features of flashcards. We analyze the most efficient ways to use flashcards in the classroom, demonstrate the ways teachers can use flashcards for controlled and freer practice. We look how to use flashcards with young learners and with adult classrooms, and we provide uh, you with some ideas for making your own flashcards. So taking this course um, means that you will be better able to use flashcards as an effective tool in your teaching practice. So if you work with kids or at, with the beginner levels, uh, I highly recommend this product as well. The next uh, course on classroom management is also made by Read One. So all of them are my favorite ones. It will help you not only to better understand and manage your class, but also to be able to practically deal with the challenges uh, that, that, that the classroom presents. It's written by Andrei Pigarev again, and um, you will learn about the basics of classroom management, such as uh, rapport, uh, interaction patterns, teacher talks, We'll, you will learn how to manage task cycles and deliver instructions, how to monitor different kinds of tasks, how to give feedback, right? And uh, of course, um, Andre offers, um, looks at problems and offers the solutions that might <clears throat> help you to manage your classroom. Uh, this course is recommended to be taken if you would like to do the CELTA course. And it will be very helpful for you um, because uh, after this course, you will better uh, you will get the tools that you will need for the CELTA course. <clears throat> so the next one, um, the next one, the next one is the course on lesson planning. I also highly recommend to take this course not only for those who would like to do the CELTA course, but uh, also for teachers who are experienced. Um, but uh, this course, um, in this course, we look at the main components of the lesson plans and why we need to write them, right? So we will pay special attention to the task cycle. We will talk about how to set tasks, how to monitor students, how to give feedback. And uh, Lida uh, looks at the lesson stages in a very deep detail. And she gives you different techniques that will help you save time when planning your lessons. So I also recommend this course uh, for all the teachers, experience and new ones. <clears throat> um, misconceptions about teaching and learning. It's a course for those who are new to teaching profession. Um, probably those who have graduated from the university or worked in another field and would like to shift to teaching. So if you are planning to do the, the CELTA course, start your teaching career, um, this course will help you to understand how uh, languages are learned and how they are taught. And it will also debunk some common myths about uh, teaching and learning languages. It's written by Christopher Rees, um, the Delta Module 1 tutor at our center, and he's also a CELTA trainer. <clears throat> and one more course by Chris on language analysis. Um, very useful for those who are planning to do the CELTA. When I did the CELTA course, um, I had a problem with language analysis because this, this is one, one of the written tasks on the course and many participants don't know how to analyze language and why do we need to analyze that for teaching. So uh, this course is also highly recommended for you if you are planning to do the CELTA and um, especially if you are a native speaker of English and don't have the linguistic education, this course will be of great use for you. <clears throat> And surprise, surprise, if you scan the QR code, you will get to our uh, website, great.university, and you will see that until the end of September, we are giving 50% discount for any course that you buy on the platform. So please uh, use this possibility because we are a new, a fresh uh, product. We are testing our courses right now. And you can become one of the first, uh, one of the first testers, and we really need your feedback. So we made this, and we are giving you a fifty percent discount uh, if you buy the course by the end uh, of September. Okay, the next product that we offer that will save you time and money as well is the teaching credential. So what is it? 
it's the bundle of courses on specific topics. So <clears throat> right now we, are, we have the uh, essentials of effective English language teaching. Uh, this is the bundle, the, the credential that uh, includes four different courses, and it helps you to save up to 25% of the price if you buy it. Uh, so what courses are included here? Um, misconceptions about teaching, learning, and CELTA, lesson planning, classroom management, and language analysis. So these courses are perfectly combined in order to install a mindset for CELTA and provide you with all necessary knowledge and skill that you will need for passing the CELTA with flying colors. So save up to 25%, but <clears throat> right now you can save even more because again, this 50% discount is valid for teaching credential as well. And if you buy it by the end of September, uh, you will get a 50% discount and um, don't lose the chance to get ready for the CELTA with us. Okay, and our um, other product um, is the library, right? So it's impossible to imagine a university without a library. So we have created a unique video library with dozens of professional development sessions by ELT experts. They are all free. So if you go to our website, great university you can enjoy dozens of these videos on different topics from teaching young learners and teens to teaching adults approaches to teaching um, teaching systems and skills inclusive educations and uh, this library is going to be extended and regularly updated because we hold teacher training events every month and of course Right now, everything is free for you. So if you uh, would like to watch the webinars or workshops on the topics that you are interested in, please visit our library anytime from any convenient place. Oh, yes. All right. Helping me to conduct the session. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> Let me tell you more about the uh, benefits of the platform. So uh, why grade university? So first of all, you can uh, learn at your own pace and choose courses depending on your needs and interests. We have plenty of courses and we offer oh, short courses which are up to eight hours and teaching credentials that consist of several courses which are up to, six, uh, to 40 or 60 hours to complete. All of our courses, they consist of short units. You can do um, any unit in one or two hours and... Uh, it's flexible and it makes it easy for you to plan uh, your time. <clears throat> the tasks on the platform, they are interactive and uh, this will make your learning journey exciting and interesting. And uh, all of them are self-study. So you don't need uh, to wait for the tutor or for the teacher trainer to check your task. You immediately get, get the correct answer with the comment with the feedback and you understand why, for example, this or that answer is wrong or right. <clears throat> so units, they have similar structure and then they allow you to get into the rhythm. Uh, let, me, let me show you the video of, the, of how it works, right? All right, just a moment. I would like to show it with the sound. <clears throat> All right.
All right. So now you see how it works. Um, it's better not to see, but to try, of course. Right. And all right. Talk about the other things that we have on the platform. So they are all high quality uh, courses from practicing teachers, which is very important. And you can immediately apply uh, everything in your classroom. And uh, of course, we have worked hard on high quality videos and audios on the platform, uh, which include lectures, explanation, comments from tutors, recordings of real lessons, which is really interesting because you can see how our teachers teach and what they do in the classroom. Uh, tips and demonstrations of how to do something by course students. And they are all really vibrant, practical, interesting, and uh, engaging. Yeah. Uh, my favorite feature of the platform is a knowledge bank, which is a special feature, and it contains the key information from each course of unit. So you don't need to take any notes because everything is kept in the knowledge bank. And it's not only the summary of the unit, but also a selection of useful resources, templates, tools, and tips, and solutions that you can implement in your classroom. Uh, the knowledge bank for each course uh, remains with you <clears throat> forever and can be accessed any time. Uh, we also provide a free demo unit in each of the courses so that you could familiarize yourself with the structure of the course and make yourself used to the features of the platform. So if you go to our platform in any course, uh, you will find a free uh, demo unit and you can complete it and uh, enjoy uh, the, the, the beginning of the course. All right. Uh, we care a lot about the quality of our courses and that's That's why at the end of uh, every course, uh, there is a final test to make a final review of what topics covered and to assess your knowledge of the subject. And based on the results of the test, we will issue uh, a certificate for you. So um, our certificates, they are shareable and CV boosting, and they get uh, they have a unique QR code and uh, which helps you to celebrate your achievements. So there are two types of certificates, certificates of attendance and certificates of completions. Um, both of them are issued up upon the final test, depending on the result that you get. So if your result is less than 50 percent, it's certificate of attendance. If you get the highest score at the final test, you, you get a certificate of completion uh, of two types again, the pass and pass with marriage, which is really nice uh, because everyone will see that you are um, an excellent uh, learner and teacher. And uh, we also issue the teaching credential, uh, which is a certificate with uh, all the courses that are included in that credential. So for example, if there are four courses in the teaching credential, in the teaching credential certificates, you will have the information ab about all the courses that you've taken in that credential. What is interesting that all of them are generated automatically. So uh, you cannot no one can influence right, the, the results of the test. So everything is very objective. And all of them meet the requirements of the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine. And all of our course, uh, courses can be counted as compulsory hours of advanced training. So you can come to school. Uh, Yula, you're unmuted. Sorry. And tell your DOS that here is the certificate from great education, from great university uh, for eight hours or for 40 hours. Please count it and it will be counted. All right. <clears throat> Our platform is compatible with all devices. So you can have the best learning experience from the comfort of your home or any place in the world using a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, or whatever device uh, you love. Let's talk about the prices, right? Everyone is probably interested in prices that we have now. So you can see the old prices and the new prices, which are now reduced to 50% and <clears throat> which are in US dollars because this is the international platform, uh, not only for Ukrainian teachers, but for teachers all around the world. And um, 
what is necessary to mention here that you can pay for the course in only one click but pay attention to uh, what currency rate is on the day when you buy the course and of course it will depend on your bank not on grade university which currency conversion they use so if they use the double currency conversion uh double check it with your bank right all right and of course <clears throat> um we um are an online uh, teacher training unit of great education center um we are not just a simple online platform uh, our uh, center is the largest uh, educational center in ukraine and uh, in the is the largest uh, authorized platinum center of cambridge assessment english in ukraine central asia and you can be sure about the quality of the products uh, that we offer um we are working on expanding the range of courses so you will see more of them on the platform soon and <clears throat> We are also working on a blog that is going to be launched uh, in September, so you will find interesting materials and articles on professional topics from our uh, methodologists and teachers, and we are extending our team um, and we are looking for uh, course writers and uh, we are looking for talents, uh, so if you are interested, um, please contact us and you can see uh, the contacts uh, on the screen right now. Um, I would like to thank the people um, who have already tested our products. Uh, this is a fresh platform and there is a lot of work to be done and we are testing it and fixing everything and improve, improving uh, our platform. Uh, so it would be nice um, uh, if you share your feedback with us. Uh, we are really interested in uh, what you think about our products. And we really want to know what we need to improve, what you would like to have uh, on the platform, what topics you are interested in, uh, how we can uh, improve and become better for you, for the teachers. Uh, so welcome uh, to the team. So uh, you can see the reviews from the testers. Thank you very much, our secret agents. Uh, you helped us a lot to prepare for uh, today and to become better. Um, visit our platform. <clears throat> and see for yourself that great university is the best place to help you grow, keep your skills sharp, provide fresh ideas for the classroom and reach your English teaching goals. And let me remind you, okay, one more minute. Let me remind you that by the end of September, all the courses are sold at a discount of 50%. And um, you will uh, find this information on, on our website and you will also receive the information in your emails together with your certificates and the recording of today's event. And uh, this is the unique chance, so uh, don't lose it. And um, join Great University and uh, teach with confidence. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, I have, uh, I will answer your questions about Great University at the end of the event, uh, right? So maybe you will, um, serve the on the platform and uh, have more questions about it uh we are a little bit late so let me introduce uh the first speaker of today's event <clears throat> it's lydia simak you've seen her already um lida is the author of two super practical uh and useful courses on uh, our platform and she is a guru of lesson planning and a teacher who knows 1001 way to use flashcards in ELT. In ELT. Uh, she is a Salta trainer and uh, an amazing person. And uh, meet Lida and her session, school year, smooth start for everyone. Yula, thank you very much for the, such a flattering introduction. So I'll try to <laughs> live up to your expectations. <laughs> I'll buy you coffee next time. You're so nice today. <laughs> okay, uh, everyone, uh, let's start talking uh, again. Um, I already asked you to uh, share like what age groups you're interested in to talk about today. So I saw kids, uh, different ages of teenagers, adults. So we will try to talk about everything. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. I will try to react to them and talk to you. And because um, this topic is not very focused, I will talk about everything 
if you ask questions, uh, I will probably go deeper into some aspects you are more interested in. Uh, I already see some questions. Uh, primary school. Okay, we will talk about the primary school students. Um, Yula, uh, I'm not a host or co-host. Can you please make me one? I can't share screen. Um, cannot share screen, please help. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for writing the um, age groups. Okay, we will talk about, mm -hmm. okay, teenagers, adults, primary. So my favorite, uh, when I have to talk about everything. Okay, we will, don't worry. So can you please uh, send, let me send a message. Uh, Okay, um, just a moment. Okay, so uh, while I'm waiting uh, <laughs> for help to arrive, um, uh -huh, so I can do everything now, excellent. Um, Okay, uh, can you please um, put a plus in the chat if you can see my presentation? Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So um, let's start talking. Um, before we start talking, I will tell you a little story. I rarely tell everyone, anyone. Um, I started teaching when I was 18. Uh, I was still a college student. I was very, very young. And uh, I started teaching uh, in a local, like actually the school that I graduated from. And of course, <laughs> I was given the worst class ever, you know, to train on. Uh, nobody wanted me to, to spoil good kids. So I was given the troublemakers. And uh, my first lesson looked like the war of the world, uh, of the worlds. If you ever read the book or saw the film, <laughs> so actually I was looking at the book, I didn't see what my students were doing. And while I was telling something, uh, they actually started, you know, uh, they took the plastic pens, uh, they started chewing paper and shooting each other. And because they were doing that quietly, I was not looking at them. So I ended up <laughs> with the class filled in with those chewed paper balls all over and actually all the walls and the watch over my head covered uh, in those chewed paper balls. And I didn't realize that until the teacher who was teaching after me, you know, found me after my lesson mad and furious and she started shouting at me and she made me clean the room. Um, I still don't know how I actually <laughs> managed to continue my teaching career after that, uh, but now I realize that actually that happened because I didn't have, um, I didn't know how to start with my students. I didn't know what to look at and what to do with them. Uh, hopefully <laughs> I learned and um, I'm very happy if I can share something with you that will make your lives a little bit easier. So what we will start with. Um, so I want to start with asking you, uh, so what are your concerns about the start of a school year? I will give you 40 seconds to write one short sentence in the chat. Um, a little example from me, for example, students misbehave. That's a typical concern. Can you please write your concerns in the chat? I'm sure you do have some, because... Mm-hmm. Diagnostic test, classroom management. Students don't do homework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Misbehaving. Students don't listen. Okay. Lack of attention. Uh huh. That's a good one. Uh huh. Won't able to study online. Uh huh. Online. Okay. Yes, understand you. Ignore the teacher's remark. Oh, that's my favorite. Students ignore you or ignore me. Mm -hmm. No motivation. Okay. Uh, tiredness due to online learning. Okay. Discipline. Um, 
online. Ah, cameras. Cameras off. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, that's a typical problem. We will talk about this. Um, students feel bored. Uh huh. Discipline. Okay. Uh, methods for keeping students engaged. Uh -huh. Okay. You should feel your four still skills to conduct anything. Yes. So thank you very much for sharing. I understand that I will try to address uh, knowledge forgotten. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it will not be fixed on the first day, but um, eventually I think that um, it's easier to address the knowledge lack uh, than uh, the lack of discipline, because if you don't have the discipline in your room, the learning will not happen. Uh, new textbook. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have time, we will talk about this, Elena. Okay, so here are the, um, uh, the situations that I prepared for you. So students don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, might be similar to they ignore, they don't listen. Students don't want to work in pairs or groups. Uh, if you, if you uh, use pair work and group work in class, uh, sometimes you might face the situation when you set up a very nice activity, you put them in pairs or you put them in groups and they don't talk. This is one of my biggest fears, actually. This is something that might be my, my nightmare when I sleep. Um, but hopefully I know some methods how to uh, address all these things. So uh, something important that might help a lot with most of the problems that you mention is this. We need to establish class routines. Um, the word routine, when we talk about English, is it something positive or something negative? Uh, can you please put a class plus or a minus in the chat? What do you think about this? Yay, I love teachers. Positive, exactly. So uh, routine in English, this is not something boring, but this is something usual and predictable. So um, why is it important to have clear, understandable routines in class. Can you please write one or two words in the chat? They know what to expect. Thank you, Natalia. System, thank you, Oksana. Structure, thank you, Anastasia. Uh, discipline, safety, yes. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, forming habits, this is the word I was searching for. When we are in the situation, when we don't know what to expect, this is stress. And the younger we are, the bigger the stress. Um, if you understand what's going to happen, yes, Valeria, nobody gets nervous. Uh, if you understand what's going to happen, if the routine is clear for you, this creates a safety environment for students. And when they don't feel scared or nervous, you will have much fewer problems in class. So routines are important. And we will talk about how to establish them and what these routines need to include. Um, so we will start talking about uh, what to do in the very first lesson. So you meet them for the first time. Very high chance that this will be online. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is you have to establish clear classroom rules. So um, if you think about your um, experience as students, um, like the teacher might be any kind. I mean, a strict teacher or a funny teacher, whatever teacher. It's always easier if you know what the uh, requirements are, what the rules of the game, uh, of the game are. And uh, if students know that, for example, they have to keep their cameras on, and this is the rule. If you establish this rule from the very beginning, it will be so much easier for you because if you allow them to stay without their cameras, uh, when you start teaching them. And then somewhere like a month later or a few weeks later, you start talking about turning their cameras on, it will not work. But if you think about it, it's going to be online and you know that you might have problems with cameras. Make it a very clear rule. So uh, students need to be aware that when they are in your lesson, their cameras might, must be on. 
you have to talk about it. You have to explain why it's important. And if they don't do it, you have to react. Because if you don't follow your own rules, they will not work in class. And the rules that are not followed, they are not rules. So this is a problem. Uh, it means that if you establish a rule in class, you have to be consistent. It means if you ask students to turn on their cameras, it means that when they do not turn them on, you have to ask them to do it. Uh, if you do it every time, every lesson, all the time, <laughs> I believe that students get, they get tired of it. They know that you demand the cameras on and they will do it. There might be some situations when there is a problem, uh, like a person can be abroad uh, and they have nothing, they don't have a camera or something like this, but this should be an exception. And you have to talk about this in class because this ex ex exception, it shouldn't infect the whole classroom. So uh, if they have their cameras, they have to be on. If you uh, set it up as a rule, uh, it will work so much better than not setting it up as a rule. So this is a typical problem, but if you are consistent, it works. Um, my typical example, uh, I don't know uh, if you remember like 10 years ago when we had that marshrutkas that appeared um, in Kiev, there was the, the transport and uh, it wasn't the government transport, but there was a kind of a private transport. And um, a lot of people asked them to stop not on the bus stops, but somewhere, uh, can you stop near that supermarket? Uh, can you please stop uh, at this crossroads? Can you let me out here? You stopped here. And they did it. And there was a lot of problems with the traffic because uh, like they stopped everywhere and the cars couldn't move because of them. And uh, it looked really chaotic. But then, um, uh, the government, they just adopted the law that, uh, that those such transport, they cannot stop anywhere but on the bus stops. And because they started busting, you know, those drivers who violated the rule and who broke it. And I think there was a punishment because of that. People actually learned to ask for a stop on the bus stops very, very quickly because the government was persistent and they were consistent and they did uh, you know, they introduced the rules and they stick to it and they punished people who broke. So it works very well. Um, if you establish the rule, everyone must follow the rule. It works very well if you do. Um, uh, if, uh, if, if a student refuses it, what might be done? Uh, we will talk about this because, um, guys, it doesn't mean that you just come to class and you start, you know, um, a lesson with a very strict person who kind of says, okay, starting from now on, we have these rules. You cannot break. It doesn't work like this. Your students will hate you and they will be right. What you can do is you can create the rules together with class. And um, what I usually do with my students when I'm talking about kids uh, and teenagers is actually we create the rules together. And I asked them, okay, guys, um, when I teach you online, uh, do you want to see my face? Or do you want to see an empty black square? Well, the answer is yes, they want to see my face. <clears throat> and I say, okay, guys, and when you talk to each other, do you like talking to black squares or do you like wa watching, seeing people? They like seeing people. <clears throat> and I say, okay, when I talk to you, do you think I want to see black squares or I want to, to talk to a person? And I elicit from them that using a camera is actually, it's nice and polite and respectful. Now I'm talking about kind of teenagers. Um, and um, I kind of push them kindly to um, that idea that having your cameras on is a nice thing to do. And guys, let us make it a rule. You have to have your cameras on. Uh, and by the way, together, we can create a punishment for people who break rules. There are lots of interesting examples. Uh, for example, uh, well, it depends. They can uh, introduce different punishments. Um, I don't know, <laughs> they can sing a song or something or uh, do an extra homework task, whatever. But um, it's a good idea if you develop it together with your students. 
Um, so possible con con consequences for violation. Uh, so when they still violate the rules, uh, I try to talk to them in person and I explain why this is important. And I ask them uh, to follow the rules. Usually this works. Uh, if I have really, really bad cases and I don't have the contact with that student and nothing else works, um, I can tell that, okay, I'm sorry, but this is the rule and I will have to talk to your parents. Uh, usually this works, but you cannot tolerate uh, breaking the rules because if one person breaks the rules, uh, it infects everyone and uh, you don't have discipline in your class. <clears throat> well, uh, unfortunately, this doesn't happen in every class. And uh, it doesn't happen um, for a couple of reasons. And um, um, the reasons we will discuss in the next slide. Just put a mental tick here. I just wanted to show you what you can do with your class. So example from, us, from my school life, I still do it, but I don't take pictures. Um, you can sign a contract with your students. Uh, this is from the times when I was a school teacher. Uh, I still have a couple of photos that uh, on the first day I met my students. If you have a look, they're like 12 year olds. So they are young teenagers. And we developed a contract. And if you look at it here, this is what the teacher must do. And you see that I, we started talking to them about the rules for me. And you see, what they wanted from me, normal amount of homework. I promised them not to give too much homework. Uh, mustn't speak, must be, mustn't scream. I'm the person who doesn't scream, so it was easy for me to promise not to scream at them. And the teacher must speak English only. So these were the demands from the students to me. You might uh, feel a bit worried about, okay, how can I allow my students create rules for me? Oh my God. You know, every time they created a stupid rule, for example, when someone said, okay, the teacher, you only put us 12s every time. There was always a student who said, oh, it's going to be unfair, you know? So they regulated the stupid rules inside that classroom. And if they didn't, if they kind of double dared me, okay, the teacher, we want 12s every time. I said, okay, no problem. I can put you 12s. <clears throat> but do you think it's going to be fair? I will put a 12 to a person who works hard and I will put a 12 to a person who doesn't do anything. If you are from, not from Ukraine, a 12, this is the highest mark in the Ukrainian school. And this helped me, you know, cause that reaction that the, the, the student said, no, no, this is not a good rule. Teacher, let's not put it on the board. And they said, okay, okay, you are, uh, you know, you set the rules for me. Okay, I will not put it on board. Not everyone is happy. So you say you manipulate them. But usually, well, they're nice kids and they will suggest nice and sane things for you. If they suggest something crazy, uh, talk to them, elicit that this is not a good thing to do. And look at the rules that, they, that, they, that we created together for students. So the rules are must do homework. This is always my rule. Um, then uh, um, must speak English, mustn't chat. Must Becca? be quiet. Uh, can you please mute yourself? I'm sorry, because uh, I, I hear some noise. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, mustn't play, I meant, uh, I don't know, mobile phone games or something like this. And mustn't rock chair. That was a crime in my classroom when I was a school teacher or, and mustn't chew gums. Uh, I was the, the funny teacher at school because I always knew who had a gum in their mouth, <laughs> even though they tried not to chew. So that was another moment of humor in my class. So, and we signed this contract. I signed it as a teacher and you see that there is a student signing it. Uh, and I had these contracts with all my students. And if you look at this, this is one contract. I have another one. They were actually different for each class because each class had slightly different focus. Like here, again, uh, mustn't use gadgets, must do homework. Uh, it, it was very similar, but it was formulated in a different way because I elicited these from kids. Um, these contracts, they work very well with young teenagers. Uh, Older teenagers might not be very interested in signing contrast, contracts, but if you think that it might work well with them, you can do it. So usually it works very well for younger teenagers and like for, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, because they feel that they have the power and they like feeling that 
they rule and they create rules in class. So um, something else you can do, remind students about the rules. So these are uh, the reminders that I took a picture of uh, at grade. So these are the rules that great teachers use in class. And every time somebody violates the rule, what you can do? Can you see what I'm doing? Do I even have to speak? I can point to the rule and just look at them. So uh, remember, you, are, you have to be consistent, right? So you have to remind them to follow the rules, but be nice and encourage them to do that and praise them for following the rules. And uh, uh, when your students know the rules, follow the rules, are reminded about the rules, uh, it's so easy to manage such class. Uh, so rules have to be established. If there are no rules, there is no discipline in class. Students don't know how to behave. And you know, when they grow up, they tend to touch the boundaries and push the boundaries. So they need to know where the boundaries are and they need to know how to behave. Um, Something else you can do is you don't have to, if your students are really, really small and they uh, still don't know English or they cannot read uh, or they're complete beginners, why don't you use pictures? Again, what it means, put your hand up if you want to speak. You can teach them. And something else you can do when you develop the rules, you can create classroom posters. Again, this is the poster from Great Education Center. Uh, these are the school rules. By the way, another trick that you can use uh, that works for my students when they say, okay, teacher, why cannot, why cannot I turn off my camera? I am a free person. There is a constitution in Ukraine. <laughs> you know, what I say is, yes, you are a free person. There is a constitution in Ukraine, but there is a constitution in Great Education Center and we have a school rules that have to be followed by everyone. And one of the school rules is you have to turn your camera on. This is the school policy. This is the argument that might help you in your teaching, which means that this is not you, a bad teacher who created the bad rule that students don't like, but this is the school that have their policies and they have to follow this. Um, exactly. So um, that is the first lesson, clear yeah. rules that you remind students of. Ideally, you have a poster that they can see. Uh, you can write, I, I don't know, uh, they can draw this poster, by the way. They can make it together. And this is a wonderful uh, activity that help form a team. So uh, I would suggest uh, that the, your students, they can make this poster together in the first lesson. And that is the wonderful activity that will help you um, make them feel more comfortable working with each other, which brings us to the next step. Um, they need to know you in the, on the first day and each other. This is very important. Uh, if there is just a person we don't know and she's strict and she doesn't smile and she starts, I don't know, opens the book and just starts teaching, this is a scary teacher, <clears throat> but if you start with something like this, who do you think drew, drew this? Who's, who, who, who is the author of this masterpiece? <clears throat> yeah, that's me. Do you think it took me a lot of time? You can just shake your head. Five minutes. I just took a marker and drew it and took a picture with my phone, which means I can use it online. Uh, do I look like a talented artist? No, but uh, I have some pictures and uh, this activity is, guys, look at this. This is my emblem. Um, it says something about me as a person. There are three pictures. Can you talk to your partner or can you talk in groups and um, think what these pictures mean about me as a person? For example, do you think I sell flowers when I have free time? I don't, but I have a little garden on my balcony and I can actually take a picture of something that I grew on my balcony. Last year, I grew some tomatoes because there was a lockdown and I was bored and I had a balcony of tomatoes. 
uh, next year I'm going, I'm planning uh, this year. I have rosemary next year. I'm planning to have basil because I like pasta sauce. So do you think it's interesting for students to hear about this, about your teacher? Why not? I would be interested to hear this about my teacher. Here, again, they can think about it. So I like space and um, this is my favorite animal. So uh, they discuss it with their partners and they make ideas. There. So, so they make some guesses about me and we can have some laugh, you know, there could be some humor, you can smile and it melts the ice between you and between your students. And it actually doesn't say anything personal about me. But this is something nice that puts a bridge between me and my students. Uh, this is the easiest way to do and my favorite, like one minute, a marker, a piece of paper. Uh, you can do something more sophisticated. Some, a lot of people has already seen there. <clears throat> like you can put a start in the, star in the center and put some pictures around. So it's very similar. You can use pictures, you can use numbers, you can use words. Uh, why I like these activities, because you can use them even with the students who hasn't learned English yet, or who know very little English or who cannot read, because you asked me about four or five-year-olds. So you can try, I don't know whether they will work with such small kids, but you might give it a try. The next step, after your students make guesses about the teacher, they do similar stars or drawings about themselves, work in groups and make guesses about each other. And it helps them melt the ice. And this is important. You might be working in a school where students have been living, I don't know, um, studying together for all their lives. Still, I remember my childhood. I was a school child and I have classmates I, I, I don't know, uh, studied with for, for five years. And we didn't even say hello to each other because there were different groups who communicated inside my class, but the, the groups didn't communicate with each other. And there were classmates I never actually talked to. And when I think about it, that is terrible and crazy. But the problem is that we were not properly introduced to each other. We were not, uh, the ice never melted between us. And it's even important to do every year uh, after school holidays because children grow. And when they become young teenagers, they turn from kids to young teenagers. Uh, their attitude to each other change and they become strangers to each other when they become teenagers. So you have to do such icebreakers every time they have a summer break because you have to reintroduce them to each other. Um, some of them change so fast, uh, like two months ago, that there was a girl wearing school uniform and I don't know, looking like a perfect, I don't know, perfect A student. Two months later, she becomes, I don't know, <laughs> a punk with, I don't know, pink hair, something like this, strange clothes. So they change a lot and they need to be reintroduced to each other. You can Google icebreakers uh, in class and online. I will suggest a couple of ideas um, here, I think just, uh -huh. okay. Uh, I will suggest a couple of ideas later, but there is an important word that um, we, you already heard from you, Lachorna, and from me. So you need to establish rapport. Uh, rapport means uh, good relationships between students and the teacher, and when students have good relationships with each other. Uh, because if you want them, you, you teach them English. Um, and uh, teaching English means that they have to talk because they have to speak. This is not maths that you can just, you know, solve problems and not say. Uh, and uh, who students speak to in a lesson? Not only to a teacher, they have to speak to each other uh, because they have to, I don't know, discuss things, practice their English. And very bad situation when students don't want to talk to each other. And I've had uh, um, classes like this when they didn't do, they didn't go very well. They didn't, they didn't get on well with each other. They didn't talk, sometimes hated each other. And I couldn't uh, change their partners. Like they had a friend they were talking to all the time and sitting next to. And uh, 
there were kids who were ostracized and nobody wanted to talk to them. And I still had to teach them English. So I had to fix some problems in this class in order to be able to actually teach them. So, and there is a solution for such things. If there is nothing, I mean, serious, if there is no serious conflict, um, uh, all those things can be fixed. And they are fixed uh, by several things. Um, uh, first of all, you have to melt the ice at the beginning. Remember my activities uh, with that star and with that emblem and so on. So when kids do things like that, um, they feel more comfortable around each other and they can start talking to each other. Um, apart from this, um, you have to have good relationships with class because if you have bad relationships with your students, learning will not happen. Uh, there will be, you will have to push them. Uh, you will have to make them learn, which is not the nicest policy to both you and the students. Uh, there are things that you can do. They're easy, they're obvious, and they're absolutely necessary. First of all, call students by names. When you address them, uh, always uh, remember and call them by names. I'm sure that all of you do, but um, it might not be something obvious for some teachers who have experienced different studying themselves. Because I remember uh, being a student and most of the time I was called by my last name. And which is not very nice, you know, uh, not like, Less than half of the, the teachers actually knew my real, my normal, my first name. And I was a kid, you know, so call them by their names. Um, this is always very nice. Nominate them. Smile. This is very important. Uh, I understand that some of you might be strict teachers. Try smiling. Remember, you have rules. Students know what they can do and cannot do. Your smile will not spoil them. Your smile will make them trust you. Sometimes your smile can be, uh, I don't know, ironic smile or something like this. But anyway, you have to be positive to, to people. Um, so smile doesn't mean that you're weak or you have no authority. Smile means that you have a good relationship with your students. Um, do small talk to them. Uh, ask them how they feel, ask them how their day was, how their weekend was, um, what's happening in their lives. Um, I sometimes made uh, terrible discoveries about my students because, for example, I uh, remember those kids who were signing contracts on the board. I had a couple of classes and I discovered, because I did small talks, I discovered that some of, some of them uh, are facing terrible periods because their, their parents are divorcing and they think that that's their fault. Some of them didn't have breakfast because um, their parents were went out of, I don't know, they, they just uh, took off to work very early and um, they didn't control whether the kid actually ate anything and they didn't eat anything till the evening. And there were 12 year olds, they had to eat. Some of them didn't sleep and watching some series at night and then they, they felt sleepy all day. So these are the things that I discovered I was a teacher, so I sometimes discovered some things that their, their parents didn't know. And I tried to do something with that. I talked about like, okay, you have to eat. I, I even fed one of the kids who was always hungry because of that. Uh, and um, I told them, I told the kid who, whose parents were divorce, divorcing that it wasn't her fault and she shouldn't like cry or worry about this. I was talking to that kid who didn't sleep at night and explained, okay, if you watch serious is at night and not sleep you will not have good teeth because now your teeth are growing and you have to sleep to grow good teeth you know so um and i discovered lots of things that they actually wanted to talk about so and um they trusted me because they felt that they cared it doesn't mean that you have to talk to your kids or teenagers about their personal lives if they don't want to but if they want to share um uh, you might be the person who listens to them and this will help them trust you and this will help uh, establish that positive atmosphere in class. And this is very important. Praise, very important. Praise students for doing something well, for hard work, uh, for being attentive, for doing homework. Praise them when they deserve that. Do not praise for everything. But if the praise is deserved, you have to praise your students. Uh, this is endorphin and dopamine. 
These are the hormones that make us happy and that stimulate us to ask for more and want more next time. So when my teacher praises me for doing things nicely in class, I want to do them more. I want more praise. So uh, remember to do that. This is important. Very important thing. You have to respect your students, especially when we talk about teenagers. Teenagers are kids, kind of kids, who want to be treated like adults. They hate to be treated like children. They will never forgive you if you treat them like children. But if you treat them respectfully, if you show that you care about their opinions, um, you will get respect from them. But it doesn't mean that only teenagers need respect. Uh, all the kids, adults, everyone needs respect. And they really appreciate if you do show it. Mm. So next, show that you care. It's connected to what I talked to you about small talks. It's like uh, if you hear that your student is saying, okay, I'm going to have a competition on Sunday, I'm worried, and this is Friday. On Monday, ask them about how the competition went. They will be very happy to tell you. And it means that you care and they share and you create that atmosphere of trust. Um, very important, something that might not be very obvious for us, for teachers, and it's very difficult online, but it's possible. It's very important uh, to do eye contact. If you have face-to-face -face classes, when you talk to kids, you have to sit down and your eyes have to be on the same level. Um, when we talk about kids, uh, until they look into your eyes, there is no contact with them at all. Uh, so eye contact is very important. Mm, unless your students are autistic or something, then they cannot maintain the, uh, that eye contact. Like mm, people who are uh, not autistic or everything's okay with them, uh, eye contact means contact. No eye contact means something's wrong. If the kids lie, they hide their eyes. Uh, so maintaining eye contact is very important. It helps establish good rapport. Um, I told you, I already told you about um, how to get students interact. I told you about that sometimes I had classes when they hated each other and I couldn't change pairs. I couldn't make them work in groups. Uh, this is possible to fix if you do some team building. Uh, team building, you can also Google, um, Google this and to search for more team building activities because I cannot show you a lot here. We have so many things to talk about. But team building work miracles. Uh, team building activities. It means that students have to do something as a team together. And usually this is something fun. It could be a game, it could be a competition, it could be a project that they do together. But this is something that helps them start working as a team, meaning start tolerating each other, cooperating. But uh, it has to be really, really fun. It has to be something students want to do. Because if you suggest an activity they don't want to do and you make them work together and they hate each other, it will not work. Um, I had some games uh, that, that were not actually uh, connected to English, but uh, because students really wanted to win and uh, in order to win, they had to communicate with each other and cooperate and the game was really fun. So they had to start talking and working together and they started tolerating each other. They didn't start liking each other, but at least nobody started, nobody said to me, I'm not going to work with her or something like this in the middle of my class. Um, when uh, we talk about online, this is why you need your cameras on. Because if the camera is off, it's very difficult to uh, make a team. Uh, sometimes it works, but the camera is crucial here. Uh, how it, it helps students start working in pairs and groups. And this is what you want as English language teachers. And um, it helped them uh, tolerate their partners um, and uh, feel comfortable around each other and in front of class. Uh, you might have a class uh, that um, where students don't want to say something because they know that they will be mocked at or laughed at by their partners, which is something I'm very strict about. When I notice something like this, um, I talk to my students and I explain that this is not appropriate. And making mistakes 
is normal. Making a mistake is not a crime. And we sometimes make mistakes because we don't know how to say something, but we try new things or we, we, we use um, a grammar, I don't know, grammar structure that we don't know how to use properly, but this is good that we're trying. And everyone makes mistakes. And even the teacher makes mistakes. Uh, something that I did, uh, you know, when I, when I write on board, I sometimes, I can make a mistake because, you know, the letters are huge and when you're writing, you only see isolated words or pieces of phrase. And sometimes you write something, you step back, you look at what you have written, it's like, oh my God, there is a mistake on board. <laughs> Oops. Um, the obvious solution, like, like the solution for me, what I did when I was a school, school teacher and what I sometimes do with my students, I say, okay, guys, your teacher has made a mistake. The person who finds the mistake first will get a high mark. And that was fun. They started reading. They start reading what I wrote on the board. And they start searching for my mistake. They find the mistake. They get the mark. Everyone is happy. Do you think that they, they feel that they have a stupid teacher who makes mistakes on board? No. But this is another way for me to explain, guys, everyone makes mistakes. There are different reasons for mistakes. And even I make mistakes as a teacher. I'm a normal person. Um, but making a mistake is not a crime. And no one is going to laugh at you if you say something, if you say something wrong, if you make a mistake. That is okay. Uh, if you create environment like this in your class where making a mistake is not a crime, uh, students will feel more eager to talk. They will not be afraid to say something because they know that nobody's going to laugh at them. So this is something I'm very strict uh, about. And when I, when I notice that someone laughs at someone, I never tolerate that. And I, I show them that this behavior is inappropriate and even ugly. And if they respect you as a teacher, if they like you, if they like your lessons, and if they see that you are not happy with what they do, if you consider what they did, uh, inappropriate they will change that they will not continue doing that because they like you as a teacher and when they like you they want to please you so this is a manipulation but this is how things work if you want to rule the class well they need to like you they need to like your lessons and you need to like them too so respect um liking each other, uh, respecting works miracle in class. Um, something that I wanted to show you, what you can do online. So when we talk about offline team builders, uh, icebreakers, you can Google, there are lots of them actually. But uh, when we talk about online, it's much more difficult. Uh, but remember, we talked about that um, team builder is doing something together for the sake of fun. Not because the teacher wants us to do some, something, but because it's cool. Um, there are some things that you can do. For example, you can take a group photo. Uh, you can show a list of things that students need to find in one minute in their flat when they're online and take a group picture. And everyone should have one item. And you can include some funny things like a cat, a roll of toilet paper, a cup, I don't know, a piece of bread, uh, a fruit and imagine that they all have to talk to each other and say okay guys I have a I don't know a roll of toilet paper and I have a cat and I will bring I don't know a banana so they need to exchange together in order to uh, find out who has what and who will bring what and take this picture and again not because the teacher wants them to take a picture because it's fun we have to take a picture with fun th funny things that we need to find in class and it works really well and this is a very good icebreaker and team builder uh, it can be a small project. Uh, for example, what I sometimes do is when I have young teenagers um, who are still kind of kids, not adults, um, but they know English quite well. Uh, for example, I can ask them to have four minutes and write a little poem together. I introduce a poem, this one. I think it was by Alan Mill or something like this. I'm not sure. Um, I want to buy an animal. I'd like to buy a cat. But the dog is sure to buy that. So I can't buy that. Uh, and I asked them to write a mini poem, starting with, I want to buy an animal. 
and find a picture online to illustrate that. Uh, look at some poems that I've had from my students. And they, they wrote it together as teams. This one is my favorite, actually. Have a look at this. But these are for kids who know English really well and they can make poems. I can read it for you if you like. So I want to buy an animal, a real dinosaur. I'd play with it and walk with it and feed it with rock four, the cheese. So um, why not? This is a good activity. But again, uh, if your students, if you think that they will not like it, they don't like poems, they're teenagers who look bored, they will not do it. So you have to uh, select the icebreakers and team builders that are adequate to um, the age and the needs of the students. But you can Google some, you can share some with your colleagues, and some of them work really, really well, and really nicely. So this is one of the examples that you can use online. So icebreakers, team builders, creating positive atmosphere in class, classroom rules, uh, following that rules, reminding about that rules, creating the rules together with your students, showing that you respect them, but you will not let them violate the rules. This is what makes learning predictable, safe, and fun for both you and your students. Um, and this is something uh, that will help you manage them really, really well. Something else we need to talk about is how to make the class uh, learning controlled. Uh, one of the teacher's fears is to lose control. I remember that, one of my fears as well. So what you can do, uh, first of all, establish the classroom routines. Everything that we talked about before that, this is a must. If you don't establish the routines, you will not control the class. Next, remember predictable means safe. Children, especially children, they feel safe only when they know what's going to happen. That's why in kids' class, you start lessons with a hello song or doing something that you do every class, something repetitive. It calms the students down. When you have clear routines at the beginning, but only not, not only kids need routines, everyone needs routines. So clear routines, um, they help feel safe. That's why a lot of students, they were very happy to come back to learning when the war started in Ukraine, because it means doing something normal. And when you do something normal, routines are something normal, you feel safe. When we came back to work um, after the break during the war, we felt so much better when we started teaching because we came back to routines. Um, so next, follow the rules. Don't let them break the rules. Uh, very important, when we talk about kids, they cannot sit for a long time. They lose concentration. They cannot play games all the time. I mean, active games, they get tired. So as the teacher, you have to juggle and you have to change the activity. So remember when to settle and stir. If you see that they're losing concentration, play an active game to make it like to help their um, brains rest. Then they start focusing. Um, if you see that um, they are too active and a little bit difficult to control, settle them down, do a quiet activity. Um, so this is very important, settling and stirring. So uh, watch how they feel, change the activities um, in time and use attention grabbers. So uh, you might, so attention grabbers, it means that when they're discussing something, for example, they're talking to their partners or they're doing a noisy activity, you have to think of how to grab their attention, for example, without shouting. Uh, there might be lots of options for that. You can use, uh, you can actually Google attention grabbers. Um, very uh, popular thing is uh, there is a phrase which is familiar to your students. You say the beginning, they say the end, and they know that this is the time when they have to stop what they're doing. For example, um, mac and cheese, you say it, they say everybody freeze. It can be any phrase, Google them, there are lots of them. Uh, teach your students when they start, when you start saying that phrase, they have to say the ending of the, of the phrase and stop doing what they're doing. You can use um, 
other things that do not include the voice. For example, when they're noisy, I don't know, discussing something, walking, blah, blah, blah. You can use clapping and uh, you can use different clapping patterns. When they hear clapping, they need to know that they, can they have to repeat the clap. For example, you clap, they repeat. You clap, they repeat. Uh, first, just a few of them start clapping because they notice that you clap. Others are talking, busy. But then more and more of them notice the clapping and you end up with everyone repeating your clap and you don't have to say anything at all. I love the attention grabbers when you don't have to speak and you don't have to raise your voice. So Google attention grabbers in order to um, help students notice that they need to stop a noisy activity, that they need to listen to you. And my golden rule, I never start speaking until I notice that everyone's looking at me, eye contact. Because if they don't look at me, I don't know if they listen. And if they don't listen to me, they didn't hear, they have to repeat my instruction again. And I'm not a radio. I repeat my instruction yeah. once. But before I do that, I make sure that everybody listens. And your students get used to that. You do not speak until everyone listens to you. Isn't it nice? So, but it, it depends on you. So you have to teach them. Okay. Mm, something else. Um, very important. You teach English. You want them to start speaking English to you. And a lot of teachers end up in the situation when they say something in English and their students respond in their first language. Uh, this is not the situation we want. We want everyone to speak English. The golden rule is, if you want your students to speak English, you have to teach them. So uh, if you teach them classroom language that they can use to talk to you and their partners, and if you know that they know the phrases because you taught them, you can remind them about the phrases and demand them to use the phrases. So um, when I hear my students saying something not in English, and I know that they can say it in English, I will not respond. I will ask them, say it in English. But I can only say that when I know that I taught them this and they know how to say it. And again, you can have classroom uh, language posters around your class. And when they say something not in English, you can point to the posters, not with, even without saying something, and ask them to say it in English. They get used to it and they start talking English to you. But again, you have to be consistent. You cannot demand them speak in English if they cannot say this in English, but if you know that they can, because you taught the phrases, demand this, and eventually your students will speak English to you. Um, so, what you can do is, I just Googled classroom language posters. See how many results I got. Uh, I don't like this one with the toilet. Uh, yeah. Probably not in my classroom. But there are lots of things that you can use, steal, borrow. You can uh, create yourself. Like, look at this one. Hello, my, uh, may I come in? The, the teacher just took, took a piece of paper. They took three board markers and they wrote that poster. It took 20 seconds. So you don't have to produce nice things, but this is the poster that was in the classroom from the first day and it stayed there and it worked well. So you can Google things. You can quickly produce things your own. You don't have to be a talented artist or something. Just write it on the piece of paper. Remind students about the classroom language. Praise them for using English in class. Um, consider students' needs very quickly. When we talk about kids, what is the main uh, activity for learning? What is the main thing that they, they like, how, how do they learn? What, what is the main activity? Yes, play. So is it a good idea to talk about grammar rules with kids? Nah. When we talk about teenagers, will you play with them all the lesson? Or maybe just one game if they deserve and like it? Something like this. So teenagers like communicating. So it's a good idea, especially when they like talking to each other and they have good relationships with their partner, like with, with, with their classmates. So consider their needs. Uh, if you consider your students' needs, if they do not suffer during learning because um, they have to do something that is not 
their typical activity, the learning will go well. And um, uh, you can actually um, alter things to make them more attractive for kids. I've, I've shown this to lots of teachers, but this is something I'm very proud of. This is the class I had lots of problems with. They didn't listen to me. They didn't want to speak English. They didn't want to learn. That was a trouble for me. But here they work like angels. They do a stupid task, not, not very interesting, like a mechanical um, activity when they need to ask questions and their partner answers. Why they do it? Because I allowed them to sit on windows. That's it. So sometimes you, can, you have to change some little things to turn a normal, boring activity into something fun. They were sitting on that window for 20 minutes. That were the best 20 minutes of my life with that class because they were doing the activities because they liked sitting on the windows. So it doesn't mean that you will allow your students to sit on the windows all the time, but you will try to find the things that your students like and exploit it to make them do the normal tasks, which are boring if you sit at your desk, but fun if you sit on the window or on the floor on the carpet. So if you look here, so I'm sitting on the carpet with my students. It doesn't mean that I like sitting on the carpet, but I know that they learn best and they will do an exercise better on the carpet. That's why I'm sitting with them there. So um, think about what they like doing, how they like doing. Sometimes I had groups of tired teenagers uh, and I allowed them to sit on the floor. And for some reason, on the floor, they work better than at the desks doing some tasks. So uh, maybe such little changes will help. Uh, create motivation systems for your students. So they can be different. Uh, you can Google, there are lots of them. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail because I have to finish, but something that I really want to say um, is be careful with motivation system. Your system has to be motivation, not punishment. I'm going to show you a couple of things that I've uh, seen lots of teachers use. Um, this is the task, like when students do something wrong, that guy, I don't know, that, that person, that little man, it, it makes one step closer to the shark. And eventually the shark will eat the man. Here, I have uh, the word dictation. And every time students misbehave or do something wrong, I cross out one letter. And if I cross out all the letters, they will write a dictation as a punishment. Yeah. Uh, and the last one is I uh, have stars near the names. Every time they do something wrong, I delete a star. I hate all these um, motivation tools. Why? Because this is not motivation, this is punishment. And um, uh, why if someone did something wrong, I cross out the letter and then the whole class have to, has to write a dictation, is it fair? This is a terrible feeling. And uh, um, yes, they will probably stop misbehaving but nobody will be happy with such a lesson. Same about this, this is just, I don't know, the shark is <laughs> pure violence for me. Uh, my idea, and um, the psychologists say that it works better if you punish students by not providing them with something positive. For example, uh, your students know that if they behave well and they work well, at the end of the class, they can choose the game. They will play the last five or 10 minutes. But if they misbehave, blah, 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 there will be no game. You see the difference? I'm not punishing them with dictations. The shark is not eating them. I don't remove stars. So uh, your punishment has to be humane. Uh, punishment, it means not doing something that they like. Uh, if they know, so, uh, or for example, there will be no pizza party at the end if they don't do homework. I mean, at the end of the semester or something like this. So please be careful with punishment. Do not uh, make the punishment punishment. And do not punish students um, for something that they, they do not deserve, like punish the whole class because like two students misbehave. 
So this is unfair. So make uh, the system, the motivation system positive. It works so much better and it's so humane and they will respect you as a fair teacher and they will not be afraid of you. Um, so I'm sorry, because it took me a little bit longer. Uh, this is everything that I wanted to say for today. I didn't talk uh, in detail about adults, but um, just a couple of words. Adults need routines. They need to know the rules. Uh, adults need icebreakers and team builders as well because they feel uncomfortable talking to unknown people. But if you do some icebreaking, um, it works well. They start uh, liking each other and talking to each other. Do not use very childish icebreakers with adults. Do not make them feel stupid. Respect their adulthood. Uh, uh, do not treat adults or teenagers like children. Uh, such simple rules will make your life so much easier. And we have one minute for questions. Um, if you would like to ask me about something that I haven't talked about today, please feel free to write questions. Okay, um, enlarge other pictures on the slide. Uh, you mean um, these pictures? Yeah, motivation systems, projects. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, do not take pictures of my kids because uh, um, probably I'm not allowed to uh, spread them over the uh, the net. But uh, Google. There are lots of ideas online. Uh, motivation systems, icebreakers, team builders. Uh, think of what students might like. Uh, if you think that something might be stupid, stupid, do not use it. Uh, so everything has to be safe and fun. If it's safe and fun. It's safe and fun. Okay, um, thank you very much. If you write down more questions, uh, I will probably provide you with some answers um, at the end of the session. What is your attitude to stickers? Yes, my attitude uh, is good if the sticker is deserved. And students like, like stickers, I use stickers quite a lot. Um, thank you very much. Um, so if I missed some questions, can you please drop them again to the chat? And I think I'm actually ready to um, give my word to Yula. Yula, I apologize for taking it longer. I will buy two coffees for you, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Lita. Yeah. Uh, I think I've, I've drank uh, too much coffee today already. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful session. Uh, could you? Please... And it was nice to, to see all the familiar and new faces. And I'm very happy that you're safe and sound. So yeah. please, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Could you please make me a host again? Uh, no problem. Because... Yeah, uh, thank but you it very says much. the greatest host. Uh huh. Okay, great. Are you, Yula? Are you? Okay, just a moment. I cannot see. It it says to me that you are. Probably yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I will stay here for again. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, um, let Bye, me everyone. introduce. Yeah, thank you very much, Lida. Uh, we don't say goodbye because uh, we will meet at the end uh, of the event, of course, with all the speakers, and uh, you will have more opportunities to uh, ask them uh, some questions if you have ones. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, she is my English teacher, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I was preparing uh, the project and working so hard on the project great university which i introduced to you today that they had to skip my cae prepa preparation classes um she is a general english and exam preparation teacher at great education center and uh, she's also a slp and cls trainer a celta qualified and delta qualified uh, professional and this is Oksana Nazarchuk. Oksana, can you, are you with us? Yes, yes, I am here. Hello, yeah, great, everybody. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, not as a student, but as a colleague again today. So glad to see you today. Oksana is going to talk about the question uh, that uh, teachers, uh, like the most frequently asked uh, question by the teachers uh, to students, right? Um, do you understand, right? And she, knows, yeah, and she knows uh, different ways to avoid these questions. And actually, she is going to share this in her session right now. 
Oksana, I will make you um, the co-host so that you could share your presentation. And I'm giving the floor to Oksana Nadarchuk and her session on how to check learners' understanding of new grammar structures. Okay, uh, let us check if everything works. With mm -hmm. me. Let me check. Can you see my presentation? Oh, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. we can. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me start it. Oh, oh it's really slow. That's okay. So, uh, as Yulia has mentioned, today we are going to talk about avoiding this common question. Do you understand? Uh, yeah, we overuse it sometimes, and I did so myself. So, Let's look at ways of, uh, first, let's discuss why we should avoid it. And secondly, look at ways of doing so. So um, I will begin with uh, my experience. So when I was just uh, doing my CELTA course, I had um, an experience that made me reconsider teaching grammar and a special explanation of meaning. So uh, my CELTA course was quite interesting because I was doing it part time. So I had my other groups in addition to my CELTA groups and I experimented on them and tried new techniques. And my trainers told me about CCQs and clarification of meaning, but I kept doing it my own old fashioned way. Until one day when I was teaching Be Going To. And it wasn't the first time I taught it, so I knew that this is a tricky structure because my students often forgot about B and they often forget about two. So I explained what it means and I uh, used color coding to uh, highlight B, to highlight two. So everything was fine. I asked my students, do you understand? So they seemed to understand. Everything was going well. We did some grammar exercises, controlled practice, semi-controlled practice, so we built sentences, we started asking questions, and then what one student asks me, in Ukrainian actually, so he says, but uh, how do we use it? And I'm like, okay, again, and I start explaining again where we put B and all that stuff, and then the student says, I understand how to make sentences, but what does it mean? And I was like, okay, Oksana, you failed. But this was actually a good aha moment. At that time, I realized why all that, uh, why we uh, have to ask all those checking questions, why we have to clarify the meaning the way we are taught during SALTO. So actually, that wasn't a total failure that helped me to learn a valuable lesson, which I want to share with you today. Now, uh, if you are like me, maybe you were more fortunate, but if you are like me, this is probably your school or university experience with grammar explanation. So the way it happened, um, in my childhood, the teacher would say, okay, class, today we, st we are going to, uh, we are starting, be going to. The teacher would write it at the top of the board, then um, show, oh, okay, uh -huh. So the teacher would write the name of the structure, then write, uh, explain in detail and write the structure of it so how to make positive sentences negative sentences and then at the end there would be this sentence how to use it there will be the rule but by the end of all that i would uh, switch off i would think about something else i would never pay attention to that and somehow I learned this way of teaching. And to be honest, at the start of my career, that was the way I taught grammar, unfortunately. However, that experience plus my CELTA course taught me that 
No, we do it differently. And we always begin with meaning first. That uh, my SOTA course taught me that there are three aspects of teaching grammar, not only the form, not only the structure, how we put words in the correct order in sentences, which endings to use, but we start with meaning. We explain to our students what the structure means, how to use it, when to use it. Then, only after that, we focus on the form. And only then we, uh, only after that, we even discuss, uh, we even practice pronunciation. But why do we start with meaning first? So it's not just for learners to understand what the structure means. Yeah, it's logical, but it's motivating for our learners. So when they know what it means and when we use it, clearly they will be more motivated to apply their knowledge in speech or in any situations where they need English. So it motivates them to keep using the structure. And because it ensures further use, it also ensures students' improvement. And uh, moreover, uh, discipline. If you teach uh, teenagers or kids, you probably know that if they don't understand something, they start misbehaving. They misbehave so much. So it also helps with discipline. So clarification of meaning first, it's not just the formula. There are reasons why we do that. And the main reason is to encourage our students to use the structure. Now, how do we start clarifying the meaning? So yeah, the teacher can come to class and say, good morning, we're going to study, be going to today. So we use it to talk about the future and about our future plans. Yeah, we can do it. But again, think of people who are tired uh, after work or teenagers who have so many classes and so many other interests. Will they listen to you? Probably not. That's why uh, we begin by establishing the context in which your learners will encounter the structure first. So some common context that can be used are uh, a reading text or a listening text. And if you think about any um, modern uh, English books, mostly um, they use this way of establishing the context. So they give you a reading text or a listening text. For, uh, you have to do some tasks, uh, do reading or listening for gist, for detail. You have to analyze, the, uh, discuss the text, the questions about it. And only after that, you will, ta you will focus on grammar. This is done for a reason, because um, students don't even notice how they come across the structure. And later, when you start clarifying it, it becomes easier for them to understand the meaning. But it can also be an anecdote or a personal story told by the teacher. For example, let's say you're going to teach past simple and uh, you, you begin the lesson by telling your students about your last weekend, something extraordinary that happened last weekend and tell them the story. They are interested in the story. They don't pay attention to the tenses, but you introduce, the, introduce these to your uh, students at the same time. Or it can be a leading discussion. Let's say you are on the verge of um, the summer break and you can ask your learners, so what do you want to do this summer? And you ask them about their plans. What are your plans? And they give you their, they share your plans with you and you note them down on the board using the structure, but not without focusing on it yet. 
or it can be a picture and its description. For example, it works really well for present continuous where you show the picture and you describe what's going on there. It works well for comparatives and superlatives because you can visually show the differences. For example, Tom is taller than Bob. So Tom is one meter 80 centimeters, but Bob is just one meter 60 centimeters. So Tom is taller than Bob. You show the pictures and it's clear. So it's also the context. So there are different ways you can establish the context and how planners notice the structure. But before you, uh, when you choose the context for your lesson, you also need to evaluate how good it is. So in order, for example, to choose a good reading text, it's necessary to make sure that uh, the structure is used in this text a lot. So there is a lot of repetition of the structure and your learners can see it, um, can notice it later on, and you will use these sentences for your explanation. But it's also important to make sure that the structure is used naturally in such a way that uh, doesn't draw too much attention. So students will understand from the context what it means and the structure itself won't be the main focus for them. The story, the information in this text will be more important. And clearly, the meaning of the structure should be made obvious through this context. If all these aspects are present in the text, for example, that you want to use, or in the story that you're going to tell, then your um, the context that uh, will be um, quite helpful and will um, enhance your teaching. Now, so how do we work with this context? So we read the text, we uh, made sure that the text that we want uh, to use, uh, it uses the target language often uh, that the meaning can be made uh, is obvious so students can understand the meaning and uh, you also made sure that um, it's natural use of the structure so what do you do next you focus on example sentences one common mistake that i made in the past and I noticed it while observing other teachers lessons and my teacher training practice is using example sentences that are disconnected from the context. So you have read this beautiful tag, this nice text that uh, contains the grammar. Why not use the sentences from the text? Why develop other sentences? So take the sentences from the text. Let's take just one sentence. For example, in this case, I chose this marker sentence from the text. So we read the text about, um, my, oh, we discussed my plans for the next year. So I chose this sentence and I, I write on the board, I'm going to study Spanish at university. I underline this, I'm going to study, but I'm not focusing on the form yet. And after that, I have two choices. I can tell my students, so look, I'm going to. The structure is used to talk about future plans. It's possible, but I can engage my students more by asking them questions. So I can elicit the rule from them. Why is it better? Because they will be more focused Throughout the uh, explanation, they won't um, start thinking about something else. They will start analyzing the language at once 
while looking at the structure and while trying to answer my questions. And even if their answers are wrong, still they will learn something about the structure. So they at least they will learn that, no, it's not about the past, if, if for example, they believe it's about the past. So that's why I start nominating them. I start asking questions. I elicit the rules from them. How do I do that? By asking just some simple, uh, simple questions. For example, about this question, uh, about this sentence, I'm going to study Spanish at university. So the first question will be, is it about my past, my present, or my future? So future, okay, good. Then I can ask them, is it my plan? Yes, it's a plan. Do you think I made this plan now while speaking to you or before? Okay, before, good. So in this case, I elicited it from them. But what's important, I do not nominate. Why? Because this is the first time they encounter the structure. And I'm talking here about elementary students who see the structure for the first time. So this is the first time they encounter it. Yes, I made sure that the meaning could, uh, will be clear from context by choosing a good text, but I can't guarantee that all of them understood the meaning clearly. That's why at this level, at this stage, I just elicit, and it's okay if stronger, stronger students answer the questions, it's fine, they help everybody understand. So I ask, is it about present, past, or future? And they say, future. I say, good, yes, future. I can even note it down on the board. Then I ask them, is it about, uh, is it my plan? Yes, yeah, good, it's a plan, yes. So I elicit from them, and it's fine if stronger learners say it. But what's important, at the end of this eliciting session, I need to summarize the rule. Students still need to hear the rule from the teacher. They helped me um, reconstruct this rule, by answering the questions, they analyze the language. Now I praise them for their good work. And I say, you know, good job. You helped me. Now let's summarize it. So we use be going to to talk about future plans, which we made now, no, which we made before. Good. And I put it on the board or just make notes on the board, etc. Do you think that's enough? We can start practicing the structure in using grammar exercises next? No, not yet. Actually, this was my mistake. That's what I did with this grammar structure. My, uh, when I had the student asking me, so what does it mean? Uh, my uh, explanation wasn't really good, but it still was quite good. However, I didn't make sure that everybody understood it. Most students did understand. So I had some stronger learner, uh, stronger students, they did understand it. But this particular student that was puzzled, no, he didn't. He needed more help. And I didn't check whether he understood it or not. So our next step after clarification is checking understanding. And how do we do it? We take more marker sentences from the same text. We keep using the same context. That's why I said we need to have several uses of the structure. We have to uh, see the structure being repeated in the text. So we take more marker sentences. For example, here I say, I'm going to watch a lot of good films. And I keep asking the same questions. I don't need to change the questions even. But this time when I ask these questions, I start nominating. So when we were eliciting, there was no nomination because uh, 
it was important for me to just elicit it from anybody in the group. However, when I check understanding, I need to make sure that everybody, including the weaker students, understands the structure clearly and correctly. So that's why here we nominate. Uh, but we need to keep in mind that um, weaker learners, they might need more time to think. And in order not to have a situation when a stronger learner answers quickly before they are ready uh, to give the answer. So what we do, so I say, okay, look at this sentence. I'm going to watch a lot of good films. Now, please be quiet. Don't say anything, be quiet. And I can even look at these stronger students. And I say, now, is this sentence about present, past, or future? Be quiet. Mm -hmm. Present, past, or future. And then I nominate one of the students. And I repeat, uh, depending on how difficult the structure is, I repeat it several times with uh, several students, Focusing on weaker students, definitely, but I don't want to draw too much attention to them. I don't want to make it seem like they are the weakest, so I only ask them. No, I have to ask everybody, but making sure that the weaker students clearly understand the structure. So I will ask them more. So in this case, we check understanding and we can repeat the cycle with one more or two more sentences. So until I'm sure that my learners understood it clearly. So here you can see how we use questions when clarifying meaning for two different reasons. So we can use them to actually elicit the meaning from them before summarizing it. And for that purpose, we don't nominate. And we can use these questions to check understanding, to make sure that students actually understood the meaning clearly. And here we do nominate and we make sure to give um, some time to think, some thinking time. Now, how do we ask these questions? How do we prepare them? How do we make them? It might seem quite easy. You just ask a question and that's it. No, there are lots of problems there. So look at this situation. Here the teacher made mistakes when preparing their checking questions. So the marker sentence was, Tom is going to study chemistry at university. And the teacher asks, has Tom studied chemistry before? Does Tom like chemistry? What's wrong with those questions? Now I want you to reply. So please write in the chat box what you think is wrong here. Good, okay. Yes, very good. What can I do? Yeah. It will be quicker <laughs> than writing. Uh, there is no context. We can't understand from the text. We don't know exactly. Okay, but this the sentence was taken. This sentence was taken from context. So we imagine that there was a reading text. The sentence was taken from context. But we don't know exactly what was before. Yeah. We, we, and his pre okay, pre sorry. preferences. And his preferences. Nothing. Just, just a second. I mm -hmm. lost it. Okay. Uh, here, the main problem is that the fact that Tom, uh, whether uh, Tom studied chemistry before or not, 
doesn't help us understand the structure. The structure is be going to. The fact that he studied it before doesn't change the structure. So these two sentences, they are not related to the structure. The meaning of the structure is a future plan which was made before speaking. Whether he likes it, whether he has studied it, it may, makes no difference. So when we prepare these checking questions, we need to make sure that we address the key meaning of the structure. We can't just ask anything. We have to address the meaning of the structure. In one of uh, my favorite books on uh, checking questions, uh, concept checking questions and timelines, if I'm not mistaken, I will include it in recommendations. It is a recommend, so they give a recommendation how we can prepare these checking questions. So we break the meaning of the structure in pieces, into pieces. For example, be going to means it's a future plan which was made earlier, not at the moment of speaking. So future plan which was made earlier. And so that's no, why intentions, of course. Intention or intentions. intentions. Yes. Future plan or intention, yes. So that's why we ask the questions this way. Intention might be a more difficult word for A2 students. That's why we can use the word plan instead of intention. But they mean approximately, uh, they are, the meaning is quite similar. So that's why we ask these questions. Is it about future, present, or, uh, past? So future. Then, is it my plan? Yes, it's a plan. Or is it his plan? Yes, it's a plan. And did we decide now or earlier? So we broke the meaning into three components, and we asked questions about these three components. Now, we address the key meaning of the structure. These questions here, they don't address the key meaning of the structure. When you ask your students these questions, they will not help you see whether they understood the structure or not. They don't help you in any way. So rule number one, when preparing these questions, focus on its key meaning, the key meaning of the structure. Then let's look at another problem. And again, we read the text. This, te this sentence came from the text. So students are familiar with the context. Look at these questions. What is not quite right there? Can you please write in the chat box? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, exactly. So a lot of correct answers. Well done. So these questions, they include the target structure. So going to. We can't use the target structure in the question because if the students did not understand what the structure means, so the question itself is not meaningful for them. So they will just say yes, no, it will be just a guess. So rule number two, we should never use target structures in, the, in these checking questions. With, with them, the questions again, don't help you understand whether they are, don't help you clarify whether their understanding is correct or not. And then let's look at another common mistake. This question again is not appropriate. Why? Who can help me? Please write in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So 
You are right. The question, the language in the question is too complicated. So be going to is first introduced at elementary level or sometimes even at A1 level. It depends on the course. So and then you ask your students, was the intention previously decided upon by the interlocutor? You will lose your students there. So they will not be able to answer the question. They will say yes or no having no idea what you're asking them. So we have to make sure that we use very simple language in our questions. So in these questions for eliciting to check understanding, the level of language should be at least one level below their, uh, below their action. So if it's possible, clearly. So use very simple language here as simple as you can because your main aim is to help your learners understand what the structure means when you use very simple language it will be easier for them to understand what you're asking them so let's summarize this so when we ask uh, uh, any checking questions we make sure to uh, we need to make sure that we focus only on the key meaning of the structure. We don't ask about something that's disconnected from this uh, meaning. Then we never include target language in the question. So if we ask about going to, then there shouldn't be going to in the question. And we use very simple language, as simple as possible. Okay. Now, let's see some more examples. Some of these examples are good ones, some of these are not. So you have here this sentence, Tom has been, has been to Italy. And again, we imagine that our students have read the text or have listened to a text, so they know who Tom is, they know about his uh, journeys around the world, so now it's only a marker sentence from this text. Tom has been to Italy. And we can see three, sent, uh, three questions here. Do you think they are good ones or not? Put plus or minus in the chat box, please. Exactly, right, yes. I can see lots of minuses, yes. None of them are good. So. Does Tom like traveling? This question is not connected to the meaning of present perfect. Has Tom been to Italy? We use the target language here. Has the time of the sad journey been made clear? The language is too complicated. However, if we look here, what about these questions? Good or not? Yeah, exactly. All of them are good questions because what we did, we broke the meaning of the structure into elements. So present perfect is used to talk about something that has happened. Uh, so it happened at some point in the past. We don't mention when it happened. And in this case, when we talk about has been, Tom is not in Italy anymore. So he went there, he came back. So it's a finished action. So something that happened in the time, in the past, but we don't specify when. So these questions are good ones. Now let's have a look at one more. Tom used to play the guitar at university. It's a pity he has no time now. So looking at these questions, do you see any good ones here? Please write in the chat box, one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so number one is good. You're right, because it focuses on the meaning. So. 
Tom does not play the guitar now. So used to, he does not do it now. Number two is not good because again, the target structure is being used here. So did he used to? We can't use the target structure in the question. Number three, again, overcomplicated, used to, typically introduced at pre-intermediate, sometimes even at elementary, um, too complicated for this level. But if we look at these questions, they are much better. So again, we broke the meaning into components. Happened in the past, repeatedly, doesn't happen now. So we ask, does Tom play the guitar now? No. Did he play the guitar in the past? Yes. And did Tom play the guitar once or many times? Many times. Now, these questions actually address the meaning of the structure. And they are not overcomplicated, and the target structure is not used there. When planning your, uh, when asking uh, instruction checking questions, uh, when asking these checking questions, at first it might be quite tricky. So if you are not used to asking them, it's a good idea to write them down before your lesson when planning the lesson. With time it will get easier, so um, most times you will be able to come up with those questions on the spot. For some trickier structures you might need to uh, plan them beforehand anyway, but at first that, um, you will need some planning to use them effectively. Uh, there are two good resources that I like using and I can recommend um, for this topic. So uh, these are two great books. So the first one, Concept Questions and Timelines, and the second one, Teaching English Grammar. However, I wouldn't recommend just copying these uh, instruction, uh, in, these uh, these checking questions from the books uh, without adapting them in any way, because even though the structure means the same, uh, no matter which culture you're from, which country you're from, still. Um, Target, our native language can influence our understanding of English structures. So for different cultures, we might want to focus on different aspects of the structure more. And that's why it's a good idea to um, think carefully which aspects of the structure you will want to pay more attention to with your students. For some uh, languages, the uh, a certain topic will be quite clear and easy to understand. For others, no. So you will maybe have to ask more questions. So it depends a lot on um, your context as well. Okay. Um, I hear somebody, some noise. Okay. Can't see who it is coming from. Can I ask everybody to keep your microphones off? Okay, thank you. So, actually, oh, we are almost done. I'm really fast somehow. Okay, so uh, to summarize, and again, summarizing the rule, to summarize what uh, we discussed, when we clarify a new grammar topic, and it's not only about grammar, for vocabulary it works the same way, but when we, uh, today we talk about grammar. So when we clarify a new grammar topic, uh, we will start with the context, as I, and as I mentioned, it can be a reading text, it can be an, a story, um, some discussion with your uh, students. So it can be different, something different every time. Then we elicit from our students what uh, the rule is by asking them questions. But at this stage, we do not nominate them. 
So we just let anybody in the group answer the questions. We can ask several students to uh, answer these questions. And then we summarize the rule. Afterwards, there is one last really important stage, which is checking understanding, where we also ask the same questions, but we nominate our learners. Uh, to make sure that everybody understood the topic. And about this stage, checking understanding, one important note, sometimes it can happen that you start checking understanding and your students give you wrong answers. And it's not a disaster. It's not the end of the world. So that's okay. They, um, uh, they keep answering uh, your questions incorrectly. Don't try to correct them at once. Come down, listen to them, ask more questions, ask more students, see whether it's just one student who didn't understand it, or maybe the whole group didn't understand it. So this is a good um, situation for you because it shows what your learners or what your students actually understood from your explanation. And based on what you discover, then you can make the decision to either teach the structure again to the whole class, or maybe uh, work with this one student who has problems. So it can happen. Don't think that if you ask perfect questions that everybody will understand at once, you won't have any problems later on. It can happen that some students will have problems. This is why you check understanding before practicing the structure. So to decide either to whether to teach it again to the whole class in a different way, or maybe you will just have to work with this individual student. So overall, that's it for me. I don't know how I managed to finish so quickly. Maybe you have some questions about the, the topic at the moment. Some remarks. We have no time to discuss a lot of things. We should give um, training and re re well three uh, yeah. mm. okay train train and uh, have the results i think this will yeah yeah <laughs> definitely yeah i see the uh, question so uh how do we deal with structures which have multiple meanings and um such as tenses. So um, we introduce these different meanings one at a time, uh, especially at lower levels. We never introduce all of them at once. So one at a time. Later on, when we um, work with the, um, higher levels, then we can summarize. Uh, so we can uh, ask separate uh, checking questions for one meaning and separate checking questions for another meaning. But your students have been introduced to them earlier. So then you just quickly ask several questions to make sure that their understanding of both meanings is correct. So then you shorten the uh, questioning um, process, but uh, ask about several meanings. But at lower levels, you just focus on one meaning at a time. You never focus on all meanings together. And somebody asks uh, asked about um, uh, CCQs for beginners, yes, they do work for beginners. So they work for all levels and even for beginners. It's just that for beginners, you have to be really, really careful with uh, how you ask the question, which words you use. You will use lots of gestures uh, there as well. So um, sometimes, uh, you might have to resort to translation, but again, it will depend on the situation. Usually, it's possible to avoid even uh, avoid translation and just ask uh, really clear questions, uh, even to, uh, when talking with beginners. Okay, and uh, 
with young learners, definitely. Please work with young learners too. Okay. And uh, I think uh, time markers in examples. Yes, yes, please do use time markers in examples. They are really necessary as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. I will uh, give floor to our colleague, uh, to my colleague, uh, Olena. And if you have any other questions, please uh, write them in the chat box. And uh, at the end, I believe we will have some time for uh, more discussion, so I will be happy to answer them. Thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank, thank you very much, Oksana. It was a really wonderful session. I hope now teachers will not ask that question, do you understand, but they will ask more interesting questions to their students, right? Thank you very much. Uh, let's meet, uh, let me remind you a few things so that we could uh, work uh, nicely here. Uh, please keep your microphones muted during the sessions because um, it's really noisy if all of you um, keep them unmuted and uh, other participants uh, who are interested in the session cannot hear everything well. Uh, please do not draw anything on the screen, okay, because the presentations are nicely prepared and we want everyone to see them uh, and to understand what, what's going on. Uh, yeah, um, and um, uh, let me remind you about the certificates. Uh, most of you will receive certificates because of, all of you were registered for the event. So we will email them to you on Monday in the follow-up email together with the recording of this event. So if you, uh, for example, missed the beginning or the, the middle part of, uh, of the talk, uh, you will have time to uh, watch it again and you will have such an opportunity. <clears throat> and uh, also, uh, let me introduce the next speaker of uh, today's uh, event. It's uh, Olena Bochkarova. Hello, Lena. Can you? Can you? Yeah, hello. Me? Hi, everyone. Yeah, can can you much. hear me well? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Lena is not only my uh, colleague; she's also my friend, and we uh, we stayed together when the war in Ukraine be began, and uh, we. Uh, we uh, cooked together and we uh, and we slept together and we, like we we did a lot of things together so she's like my sister now olena is also the academic director at great education center and uh, she is an expert in exam preparation because she prepares students for ielts and for cambridge exams and she's also an international speaking examiner and today <clears throat> she is going to share uh, very useful tips and strategies on preparing your students for B1 and B2 uh, first, B1 preliminary and B2 first uh, for school exams from Cambridge. And especially she will talk about use of English and writing parts of the exams, which, uh, which are considered to be the most tricky ones. So uh, please, uh, please, Lena, I'm giving the floor to you and let's welcome uh, Olena and her uh, session. All right. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you so much for introducing me in such a special way. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm glad to welcome you uh, from Kiev, from Great Education Center. Um, yeah, and yeah, as, uh, as Julia has mentioned, I, am, uh, I work here as the academic director, also as the teacher of general English group and exam preparation groups. And I also have yeah, experience uh, of being uh, an international speaking examiner. Right, and um, so as you can see from the title of the presentation, yeah, we are going to talk about how to teach an exam class. Well, normally we talk about uh, exams closer to the end of the academic year. However, uh, we are all here to make a smooth start and I'm really glad to see so many dedicated uh, teachers um, to, to, to what they do. Right, and we have to think beforehand how to organize things so that um, our students uh, manage to pass the exam with flying colors. Right, okay, perfect. So uh, let's have a look at what exactly we are going to uh, discuss in today's session. Um, right, 
Okay, so more specifically, we are going to have a look at the format, uh, or, and we are going to compare the format of both exams, uh, B1 preliminary and B2 first for school. Uh, apart from that, we are going to look at the features of exam classes and how they are similar and how they are different from general English class. Of course, like, there can be a combination of both, a kind of mixture, but still there are some specific features that we um, should take into account when we uh, conduct uh, an exam preparation course, if like I mean a purely one, a pure one. Uh, and uh, as Yule has mentioned, uh, we have decided to focus on two sections which are considered to be quite tricky and challenging for our students. That's use of English and writing. And we are going to have a look at the, like, basically what's, uh, what students are supposed to do in use of English, what kind of tasks uh, they, are, they, they are going to face uh, at the exam and how we as teachers can help them and overcome the difficulties and uh, how we can help them um, like, uh, cope with these tasks and do their best in the writing session. Okay, good. So let's get started. Yeah, and um, so the question uh, is why we have chosen these two, why we concentrate on these two exams, preliminary and first. Uh, the thing is that they are the most uh, common, I would say, uh, for our students to take, and uh, they may have some benefits uh, uh, for them, so they are uh, internationally acknowledged, <coughs> and um, uh, so we have decided to focus on them uh, more specifically. Now, if we talk about uh, the whole range of exams, you can see that, well, if we uh, stick to Cambridge exams, for example, uh, you can see that uh, these, these are only two steps of the whole journey. And uh, I've decided to show this uh, diagram, this slide, just to, uh, to see where we can find uh, the, the exams under the discussion. Right. Okay. Um, so, and um, before we start, I'd like to ask you uh, a question concerning your experience uh, of teaching exam classes. So, in the uh, in the chat, uh, could you please uh, type yes if you have had had or you are you are teaching an exam class now? Uh, well, no, if you still haven't. And okay, yes, I see lots of lots of teachers. Right, perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh huh. No, not yet. Individually, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so, those who have uh, who have this experience, could you please specify which exams you are preparing your students for? Or if not yet, uh, so could you please again specify which exam you would like to prepare your students for? All right. Okay, I see lots of teachers prepare for um, independent testing known as Zeno. Then B2, yeah, FC, preliminary B1. Okay, CAE, perfect. CAT, all right, A2 key. Mm -hmm. All right, IELTS, perfect. We're not going to talk about IELTS in this session, but still uh, there may be some tips that, you, that might be useful. Okay, but mainly I see, okay, right, B2. Pet, FC, yeah, okay, good. So then you are in the right place um, to talk about the, uh, the exams. And uh, since you have some experience um, connected with uh, exam preparation, let's do a brief quiz concerning the format because uh, the, the, a good understanding of the format is key both for the teachers and the students since uh, we know uh, what exactly students, um, candidates are, are expected to do in the test. So that's basically the first thing we should familiarize our, our students with. And we as teachers should also have a very clear idea uh, on what, uh, what to expect. So let's have, uh -huh. so you can see, hopefully you can see the slide with seven questions and statements, I would say. And um, I'll give you some time uh, to decide which exam this statement refers to. So basically, there are three options to answer. The statement may refer to B1 format only. The statement may refer to B2 format or both. All right. So um, just to check if you understood me. So how many uh, answers, how many options of the answers do we have? Can you briefly type in the chat? Okay. 
Right, exactly, three. So it's either B1, B2, or both. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now, my dear colleagues, so please take two minutes, um, have a look at the statements, and then we're going to discuss. Please don't type anything now, all right? Okay, so how much time do you have? Okay, can you talk? This is just to check if you, if you got me. So, okay, two, two minutes, good. Um, are you supposed to uh, type anything right now? I mean, are you, su uh, I, uh, are you supposed to type your answers right now? Okay, thank you. No, not yet. Just take your time and think about the statements. Good, okay. Let's start working. We have two minutes. Thank you. Okay, you have one minute more. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, yeah, we will discuss question by question. Uh, I will ask you to type the, uh, the answer and I will show uh, the hidden answers and then we will discuss, all right? So let's start with the first question. So there are four papers. So which exam does it refer to? Okay, feel, now feel, feel free to uh, type your answers. If you have the ideas. Okay, so again, I remind it could be either B1, B2, or both. Okay. Okay, I have the first answer. Uh huh. Good. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm not commenting now, I'm waiting for more answers, and then we will talk about this. Okay, good. Thank you so much. So let's have a look. Uh, if you can see the answer. Well, actually both. Yeah, um, there used to be three papers in B1, but since 2020, uh, uh, we've had already four papers, right? A bit later, you will see a slide with the scheme uh, of the main information of the, uh, of the formats, yes. But now uh, all of them have, uh, like both of them have, uh, to, uh, have four papers. Mm -hmm. Good, perfect. Now, uh, and uh, talking about the second statement, uh, one of the exams has a, uh, it's not a separate paper, but it's a kind of separated section, use of English. So can you type which one uh, has the use of English section? I mean, as a separate section, okay. Because both exams have the tasks, but only one has. Okay, good. Yeah, let's have a look. Yeah, this is B2. Uh, of course, B1 also contains some exams which aim to check the use of English, but it doesn't have a separate section use of English. It's present in B2. Thank you. Now, next, next statement. Uh, so which exam has a keyword transformation task? Okay, please type your answers. Yeah, and we will look today at how to deal with this tricky section. All right, uh huh. We are mostly on the same page. This is B two, and that's basically the uh, drastic difference between these two uh, these two exams. So starting from B two, um, there is a keyword transformation task. Perfect. Now the next statement. Um, so which exam 
has why uh, like has email and story or an article if we talk about the genres of writing. All right. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Maybe. Right. We will see. Yeah. Actually, this statement refers to B one because B two exam has a wider range of genres that students are expected to be familiar with. So a B1 exam is limited to email and story or article that students can choose. Good, perfect. Oh, the next question um, referring to reading is quite a tricky one. So which exam, uh, in which exam does the reading paper include multiple choice, gapped text, multiple matching? What do you think about five? All right. Uh -huh. Okay, good. I see some really experienced teachers. Perfect. Okay, good. Uh, both. In this case, both, uh, both exams uh, contain this, um, this format. Again, that's uh, a recent change uh, dated as of 2020, 2020, sorry. Yeah, but uh, both exams include this. Good. Let's move on. Uh, in which test uh, do you, uh, uh, test takers listen twice? Okay, that's clear. Good, well done. Yep, in both. So basically in all Cambridge exams, we listen twice. Mm -hmm. Good. And the final question, the speaking includes an extended term uh, aimed to describe a photo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, actually, it's more about B1, uh, because in B2, it's called the long term, and the test takers are expected to compare to pictures, while in B1, it's mostly about describing the people, the place, and what they're doing. Good. Well done. Thank you. Now, let's have a look at both at the format of both uh, exams in more detail. So first, let's have a look at... Uh, Oops, sorry, uh, let's have a look at uh, the um, uh, exam. No, this is not exam changes. This is exam format uh, of uh, B2 for school. Okay, right. So you see that there are four papers, reading, writing, listening, speaking. So usually reading, writing, re uh, reading, writing, and listening um, go all together as the written part. And then there is a separate speaking part. Uh, and you can see all the tasks which are included here, right? It's like multiple choice of different text, gap texts, and um, open close. Yeah, you can basically see that the last two tasks, multiple choice close in the reading and open close are basically use of English, but they're not, they not placed in a separate section, okay? Uh, writing, we have two parts, email and article or story, um, up to students, then listening and speaking. Good. Uh, as I have mentioned previously, in 2020, uh, the exam format underwent the changes and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the parts were uh, revised, some of them were new. And here I have um, highlighted the new ones, so something was added, right? Um, so the gap task or open close were added, multiple choice listening to six dialogues were added. Yeah, so uh, the, the, structure, the structure was revised uh, in order to standardize all the, um, all the uh, exams and to align them, so to say. Okay, good. So if we look at the structure of B2, uh, we can basically see the same four papers again, but the first one is called as reading and use of English. So it's separated. So students are supposed to, um, to have this open close, multiple choice close, word formation, keyword transformation. So here there are more tasks aimed to test use of English. Uh, you can see more genres for writing. So here students are supposed to write an essay. It's the obligatory part. And then have, they have the choice. Uh, of article, email, or letter, review, and a story. So there are four genres uh, for students to choose. Uh, talking about listening, basically the same genres, the same types. Uh, however, the level will be higher. The, the level of complexity is higher. And uh, in terms of speaking, uh, the same 
uh, for parts. The, uh, here you can see that individual turn is called long turn, and uh, it includes the comparison of the pictures rather than just simply description. And here they have a kind of discussion here. All right, good, thank you. So any questions as for the exam format? Seems to be no, that seems to be clear, but yeah, uh, I, I would like to remind you one thing that's really important. So especially yeah, with older students, so we need to familiarize our students with the exam format so that they know what to expect. And it's a good idea if they know some teeny tiny details, for example, that if they're taking the paper-based test, they should know that, for example, they, they should do writing uh, only with the paper. They are not allowed to do it with the pencil. Yeah, and it should be either uh, black or dark blue, but not the gel one. And talking about, let's say, reading, use of English or listening, it's only pencil. And they need to know how to uh, how to fill in the answer sheets, how to um, shade the spaces, whether they need to circle, to write quickly. So such things are always uh, very, very helpful, and they boost the, your students' confidence in the exam uh, when, where they are under stress already. Good. Uh, okay, so we have uh, here quite a lot of teachers who have experience of preparing for exam and teaching exam preparation courses. So uh, looking back at your experience, um, Okay, thank you, Victoria. Good. I hope to see you later in the events. Good. Um, so uh, I have a question to you. I would like you to reflect on your experience of teaching exam classes, and I would like you to compare it uh, with um, teaching general English classes. And could you please type in the chat um, some differences um, between these two types of classes, or maybe for you they are completely similar? So could you please share briefly your experience and your reflections on the, what exam um, classes look like and whether they are similar or different from general English classes, or maybe they are not different at all. Okay, thank you, Oksana. So they are, there are more exam-oriented tasks. Agree. Uh-huh, all right. Uh, Carla, what do you mean by CLT? What's that? CLT for general English. What does the abbreviation stand for? Uh -huh, communicative language. Oh, that's a very good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the point is that Carla has mentioned that she uses more um, communicative uh, methodology for general English classes. Mm -hmm, thank you. Mock tests uh, in the lessons for exam classes. Good. General English classes are more interesting and varied. Mm, thank you, Tatiana. Good. Any other observations that it's okay to make mistakes in general? Okay, what's wrong with making mistakes in exam classes? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Svetlana. Okay. Right. Any other ideas? Timing is important, definitely. Yes. Okay, because um, we are, if we are under the exam conditions and it's a good idea. Uh, to do times practice. Thank you, Olga. All right. Good. Any other comments? Yeah, if you have some ideas, feel free to, to type them. We are here to share the ideas. All right. Exam classes are different. The teacher is a coach preparing the candidates, focusing on answer strategies, equipping with data and good time management. Thank you. Great. That's a nice idea. Right, different strategies. We don't have much time, all right. So uh, the common thing, uh, mm -hmm. one more, we integrate exam preparation. Yeah, that's another good point. We can also um, integrate, mm -hmm. look the same, but close and more of the exam. Uh huh. Okay, so basically we have come to the conclusion that we do a lot of exam oriented tasks. Um, exam classes are less interested and interesting and less varied. Uh, we don't use that much of mm, communicative methodology. Um, in general, English classes, we enjoy ourselves more. We have fun and we're not under pressure. Okay, 
Yeah, that, that's a good point, Tatiana. Good. Let's have a look at the ideas that I have collected uh, from some of the literature and from my experience concerning what's the same, what's different. And um, maybe we can add even more using new ideas. Good. So first of all, I, I guess that you would agree with me if we talk about purely exam classes. Uh, these courses are shorter normally. Um, so they... They can be even two months courses or one month intensive course, uh, while general English classes are usually longer. But yeah, if uh, it's not possible to um, allocate some time to, let's say, purely uh, exam preparation classes, then we can integrate them. This is also possible, definitely. Okay, uh, then uh, talking, the next statement that I put here concerns the level of the students. Uh, so if we talk about general English classes, um, we are, mm, we can often come across the situation when we have mixed ability classes, uh, or mm, the students are below their level or a bit above their level, and uh, then uh, we can work with that, we can use differentiation in this case, differentiate, we can differ differentiate the tasks. Uh, however, in the exam classes, uh, the ideal situation is that students uh, have the level required for the exam. For example, if we talk about B2 first, then we expect our students to be uh, of B2, having already the upper intermediate B2 level, and uh, so that we uh, don't spend so much time on, on upgrading the level and we focus on exam preparation itself. Uh, that's the ideal situation, however, does not always uh, um, happen like that. And then we have to uh, warn our students about the possible outcome that the result might be lower than expected if their current level does not uh, allow them to cope with the task, um, tasks effectively. Yeah, uh, the next point that I have on my list is something that we have mentioned uh, today that the focus is on exam tasks and strategies. Definitely, we do a lot of exam-like tasks and um, we uh, develop the strategies on how to, um, to read effectively, uh, how to analyze the tasks in listening, for example, how to predict uh, what's going to be missing in either reading or listening uh, tasks exactly. Perfect. Uh, and um, well, but uh, at the same time, um, it might be a good idea to use the elements of communicative methodology for example, if I do the reading uh, task with my students, I may do gist reading, for, for example, so that they could familiarize uh, with the text and I can, we can predict uh, what the text uh, is about. For example, uh, the, uh, the text, the topic of the text is space exploration. We might have a short discussion, a kind of lead-in, where I will activate with my students' schemata about the topic and I may ask them a question. Okay, guys, why do people explore space? Is it, isn't it just a waste of time and money? And my students come up with the ideas. I put them on the board. Okay, then I ask them to read the text quickly, it's just reading, and uh, they compare their predictions and they see what's in the text. So that's basically kind of skill development and that's the element of um, communicative methodology if they discuss their ideas in pairs and do this lead-in, for example. Uh, this might be the case, absolutely. All right. Um, okay, then uh, the next point that I have is that um, a psychological moment that this that's and that's a great advantage of exam classes and why I like them so much. The students are generally more motivated and they are dedicated and they're hardworking because they have they see a clear objective of why they're here, what they're doing. So they have one shared goal. They need to pass an exam with flying colors uh, because very often much is at stake and uh, they are um, they are quite well motivated. Okay, and uh, once the students have the shared goals, we have the positive synergy in the class. And uh, I, I, I don't need to explain to my students why they need to do homework. So they understand it, they do, they do it. And what's more, they even want more to practice and um, to have higher chances of passing the exam successfully. So that's a great thing about exam classes. Uh, and uh, yeah, some of you have mentioned that we have mock tests and time to practice. Yeah, that's another good point. Probably we do them more often than in general English classes. And uh, that's connected with the next point that I have on my list. 
is that thanks to the mock tests and thanks to timed practice activities, it is easier for teacher, for you as a teacher, to be aware of your students' progress. So we see where they are, we see um, what skills needs improving, whether they need to work on, I don't know, grammar. You can highlight, you need to revise this, or this task uh, needs um, paying more attention, and so on and so on. And um, what's more, students are also aware of their progress and they understand uh, what needs improving, where they're doing well, and it also has a beneficial effect on the, uh, on the studies and their motivation. Okay, uh, then the other two um, points are connected with the fact that uh, we as teachers sometimes perceive exam preparation class as simply doing exam tasks um, and basically nothing more. That's why um, we may feel that the exams, uh, the lessons are less interesting, they are less, there is not much variety. We do, well, we mechanically, we, we may mechanically do some, some tasks uh, and then discuss the answers with the students. However, uh, it's not always uh, the best choice because students may feel discouraged. And um, in such a case, they might say, okay, why do we need a teacher if we just do the tasks mechanically? I can do it by myself. I can do the task. I can um, have a look at the answer key. Sometimes I can find the explanation why I made a mistake. That's it. That's why uh, it's a good idea if we have the balance of teaching and testing practice. Uh, definitely, we need to focus on exam Mm, tasks and we need to do mock tests, timed practice and so on. But at the same time, it's a good idea if we develop the strategies, we discuss with the task, we explain why there was a mistake and we, divide, we develop also other skills and sub-skills, let's say, if we talk about um, listening or if we talk about reading, writing and so on and so on. Well, speaking in the same place, right? Uh, yeah, that's why I remember about this, the kind of balance uh, of teaching and testing, right? Uh, and uh, talking about having fun. Um, so it's also possible to have fun in exam preparation classes if you uh, choose to adapt some of the games and um, you can uh, do it with, with, with your students, you can play it with your students. Um, but um, the, the aim uh, is basically to practice um, the, the, the language or language or linkers, for example. So this, this could also be the case. Then um, there is uh, one very sophisticated word here, backwash effects of the exam classes. You may, all, you may um, come across it uh, in the, method, in the uh, special uh, scientific literature. So basically backwash effect uh, is connected with the effect that our learning has on our tests. And ideally, we should have the positive effect when the uh, skills we develop in the exam classes uh, can be used not only during the exam, not only to take the exam and to pass it, but also um, the, so that the students can use the skills that they develop in real life. For example, B2 for schools, B2 first for school. Uh, we learn how to write an email. Of course, uh, students, ideally, if we have this positive backwash effect of our learning, uh, once the students have developed the skill, uh, they can use it not only for taking the exam, but they could also use it for real life if they need to write a formal email in the real life. Or if we talk about listening, yeah, so they can also apply it in real life when they listen to the radio program or when they listen to an interview, a presentation, or let's say reading. If we develop this just reading skill uh, to read quickly in order to understand the main facts, they can apply it in real life when they quickly need to understand um, whether the text is something that they need or not. Yeah, depending on the uh, brief um, like uh, understanding briefly the, the main facts. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the negative backwash effect can be also present. And in this case, we talk about this mechanical uh, drilling and uh, doing the tasks only to pass the exam and then just forget everything that, that we have done. Okay, I have another comment here. Exam classes are of mixed abilities. Is it more efficient to group them according to the level in group work or shall we vary the members? Oh, thank you. That's a very nice question. Yeah, agree. 
uh, very often uh, we still can face the situation when the students are of different uh, levels. And I would advise, and yeah, the question is, uh, when grouping the students, whether we should uh, put in, in the same pair students of the same level or mix them. I would say that the same rule can be applicable uh, to a like, general English class. That depends on the activity and uh, depends, depends on the wanted effect. So if you would like, uh, probably if that's, if that's the speaking task, uh, I would put in the pair the students of the same level and uh, in, in such a way they could uh, discuss um, something more effectively and the uh, student of, uh, a weaker student would not feel shy uh, when he hears the excellent answer of a stronger student. So I would pair up students uh, depend, oh, like of more or less similar um, abilities. However, when it's about, let's say, comparing the answers um, on reading or, or listening or use of English, I would pair up students of different abilities uh, so that the stronger student would explain to the weaker student why he or she has chosen this or that answer and to, to give his rationale behind this choice. So again, that, that depends, um, right? Okay, pros and cons to help students develop growth mindset about learning. Yeah, exactly. So there are, there, there, there are different uh, approaches to this. Yes, again, this might be the case also. I mean, uh, even if that's speaking, you might pair up students of different abilities in such a way a weaker student can learn something uh, from a stronger uh, partner, exactly. But uh, it's also um, the point of knowing the uh, personnel, the knowing your students as personalities, how they, um, they, their attitudes to pairing up students of different abilities. So that, that really depends. So you as teacher know your student, students better and see uh, what will work better for them. Okay, thank you. But that was a very good point. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so here we are. So basically, uh, if we look at the, um, at the classes as they are, uh, we may not find crucial differences. So they, they basically follow the same structure. We do um, several exercises depending, uh, well, the, which aim at uh, developing uh, certain skills. Uh, we have the clear aim of the lesson and we may have pre-reading, pre -reading, let's say, or leading, and uh, let's say reading, and then uh, even we, there may be a discussion um, just to develop some speaking. That's fine, absolutely. But at the same time, exam classes are different, and we have to bear in mind uh, these peculiarities. All right. Okay. Any other questions concerning the differences and the peculiarities of exam classes? Is there anything that you would like to to learn about them. So in the same way we can use, I don't know, CCQs, ICQs, we can use uh, error correction, which is perfect, which fits perfectly well, like delayed error correction, that's fine, absolutely. So we can do this. All right. Yeah, yeah, Carl, I agree with you. So there is a comment from Carla that we need to consider the attitude of the students and some may feel inferior, exactly. Uh, so, and we have to avoid this uh, developing inferiority or um, on the flip side, in superiority complex, let's say. So we need to um, maintain the positive learning environment so that uh, where all the students can benefit, sure. And uh, again, if you see that there is a situation of mixed ability group, uh, it's a good idea to think about differentiation, right? So if you know that the, if you know, if you see that uh, you have uh, fast finishers, it's a good idea to prepare some extra activities for them or come up with another task so that they could discuss on the spot and to keep them busy. If you see that the students are uh, weaker, um, you can, again, differentiate the task and you can ask them to do uh, fewer points. Let's say they can do five uh, sentences in use of English task, while stronger students can do 10, let's say, where an average student would do seven. So think of this. So this can be also a good point, how you can differentiate and um, yeah, see how all the students can benefit uh, from, from your lesson. That, that's a very good point. Thank you. All right. So um, let's move on to the most interesting and the practical part. Um, so in detail, we are going to look at some tips and strategies that we can use to make our students' life 
lies easier in the exam and we can, um, we can help them survive. So let's have a look at the first um, yeah, task. Yeah, and we will start with the use of English. Open close. So that's the task uh, when students uh, have the gap and they don't have any options and they are expected to come up with the word uh, in the gap. So uh, the first thing that we need to understand and we need to explain to our students is that the main focus here is the grammar. Uh, the students may feel frustrated. Oh, there is a gap. There are no options. Well, it could be any word. That's impossible to do. Well, you need to explain to your students that this task aims at grammar and the missing words are usually pronouns, articles, quantifiers like some, any, a lot. This could be modal verbs, this could be conjunctions and but, this could be prepositions. Oh, wait, 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 don't give the answer. I didn't, okay. Um, so, and, uh, yep. So we need to develop the strategies. So that's the first thing. So how to approach this? We need to read the sentence and we need to predict what part of speech is missing here. So what I'll ask you to do, so look at the sentence and can you please type in the chat, what part of speech is missing? Is it a modal verb? Is it a quantifier? Is it an article? So what's missing? Your ideas. I work adverb, okay. Adverb meaning like slowly, quickly. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, did I ask you to give the answer, guys? Listen to my instructions. No, you need to write the part of speech. Nothing more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Some more ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can, we can qualify it as the uh, basically prepositions. Preposition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, okay uh yeah so that's mm -hmm. and um uh, yeah exactly so basically a preposition sometimes so okay this could be conjunction or preposition all right then the next step is uh that we need to pay attention to the words around the gap and there might be a, um, a set phrase or if that's a preposition or a conjunction it is used together uh with the verb now, if you have your ideas, you can tap. Some of you have already the ideas. Could you please type your answer in the gap? Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, let's have a look at the answer. Okay, yes, as. So uh, I work as a motorbike stunt rider. Perfect, because we know uh, this as a sad phrase, work as, and then we have a job. Yeah, so the important things here, yeah, like we explain to the students what can be missing. Again, please comfort them. Make sure that they are not worried that it can be really anything. No, the choice still is limited. Uh, first of all, by, by the uh, parts of speech, let's say. Then secondly, we need to understand the part of speech that's missing and then look closely at the words before and after the gap and um, see what can be used here. Good. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Uh, another task uh, is quite similar. Uh, it's also open close, but as you can see, we have the options. So here there may be uh, a wider variety of the missing words. So this could be, the missing word can be a part of a side expression. This could be a phrasal verb, linker, and so on and so on. Uh, ideally, um, we can do the following. Um, so uh, basically applying the same strategy. Um, let's look at the sentence and uh, let's, um, let's, let's do it with uh, zero because here there are no options. So let's have a look at zero and uh, try and predict the part of speech that's missing, but not the answer, guys, that's important. Please type in the chat the part of speech that's missing here is a mm -mm of history 
Okay, agree with you. That's an art. Yeah, that's a noun. Good. How did you understand that that's a noun? What helped you? Uh huh. Noun and singular. Yeah, perfect. We have an article. Meaning is like only one word is missing. Yeah, that's a noun. Okay. So, and the important thing, yeah, of, perfect. There is a preposition. And uh, what can you tell me about the, okay, that's more refers to pronunciation, but will the first sound be consonant or vowel? Yeah, that's right. Because we have article A. Mm -hmm. Good. That's right. Okay. So genealogy is a mm of history. So we understood that this is the noun, this is singular, the first sound should be consonant. Now, your ideas, could you please type the answer? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here it's about the collocation because uh, we are talking about a kind of science. All right, yes. Uh, so in this case, normally uh, the answer is branch. It's a branch of history. Yeah, as one part, because uh, if we uh, imagine or compare history with the tree, uh, then genealogy will be a part of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a branch of history. Normally we can put it this way. All right, branch of history. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, now let's do the same with one. Here the options are given, but uh, let's yeah imagine that we don't. If, if uh, let's ignore them for a second, and uh, let's do the same in one again. Let's predict. Let's analyze uh, what part of speech is missing here. So number one, what part of speech is missing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. We can qualify it as an adverb. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, but we have already the choice here. And uh, let's decide um, which one to use here. So could you please type the answer? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look. Yeah, it's B, rather. And uh, a question here, why, um, why did you choose B? What helped you? Yeah, exactly, Veronica. Yes, we have then, and we know that this is a kind of set expression rather than when we have a kind of comparison here. Yeah, we normally know that instead um, goes with of rather than, and so except for, Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why uh, anytime we have the gap and we need to complete uh, the gap with the missing word. Well, here it's clear. And um, yeah, ask your students to look at the words around the gap so that they might have a, um, a fixed phrase or, as I mentioned, phrasal verb, um, lingers and other expressions. Good. Well done. Now, Let's have a look at another uh, task, which is more typical for B2 first, word formation. That's the situation when we have the text and we are supposed to uh, write the uh, derivative of the word given um, in a separate section. So the same story. We look at the gap and we try and predict what part of speech should be used here. Okay, thank you. You already know what to do, perfect. Yes, definitely. We need a noun here. So China is currently the largest noun. Yeah. Um, and we can also think if there can be uh, nouns that mm, define a person or an object, we need um, to think also about this. Good. And now we have the word product, which is the act already the noun, which, uh, which uh, is used to define a non-living object. So, uh, Let's think about the another known that we can use here. So feel free to type your answers. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, Oleta. All right. Okay, good. Let's have a look. Yeah, producer, right? Because we are talking uh, about, well, 
China is here uh, not the living being, of course, but we associate it with. Right, so that's the producer. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, adjective plus noun. Thank you, Carla, exactly. Um, so, and uh, in this case, yeah, we, as the pre preparatory preparation exercise, it's a good idea to um, drill and to uh, work on the word formation. Um, in most cases, these are suffixes, but uh, important thing, do not ignore prefixes um, and compound words. Uh, so sometimes this can be also the case. And um, so you can ask your students to brainstorm um, as many nouns as they can produce. Okay, producer, production. So if that was the if it was the verb produce, then we can say product, production, producer, and uh, choose the best one that fits here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, we analyze the gap. Uh, we analyze the words around the gap. Uh, which help us understand. Uh, sometimes there can be the case that we need a negative prefix or suffix. Uh, again, this can be um, understood from the, um, the the whole sentence. And yeah, another thing that uh, like that's a piece of advice that I uh, find really helpful for me personally. Uh, whenever we do the any task, um, please uh, do not be limited only by a line. Well, it, it actually works uh, for all the tasks that we have already discussed, but I would say it's especially uh, crucial for word formation. My suggestion is uh, ask your students to pay attention to the whole sentence. All right. So not just one, um, not just one line, because you never know what might be what kind of information might be in the following line. And you might need the negative prefix or you might need some kind of contrast. So that's important. So read the whole sentence. Okay, good. All right, good. Uh, yeah, context. Context is, is important, really. Yeah, and the whole sentence uh, will help you uh, to understand it better. Definitely. Good. Okay, now let's move on to probably one of the trickiest one. Um, keyword transformation. So what happens here? Again, that's the task typical for B2 first. Here we have the sentence, then we are given the keyword, and then we have the transformed sentence. And our task is to uh, write the missing words. Uh, we have to use the keyword given, but we are not uh, allowed to change it. Okay, so how to approach this task? Uh, again, that's the advice that uh, a colleague of mine gave me and I find really, really useful. So first of all, cross out the words mentioned in the original sentence. So let's try and do this. Um, yeah, so which words, let's have a look at sentence two. And uh, which words, let's find the words which are taken from, from the first sentence. So what words should I cross out? The same, yeah, exactly, Tanya. Uh-huh. Okay. So I'm crossing out a very friendly taxi driver. Oops, I let me do it here. A very friendly taxi driver. I'm crossing it out. I, I don't need to use them anymore. Okay. We and us agree with you. Okay. Good. Right. Okay. And we have drive driven. Yes. All right. Now, uh, let's look. What kind of grammar are we going to use here? What's special about the grammar? Yeah, the passive, okay. And uh, we need to, yes, okay. Yeah, some of you have given the answer. So those who also have ideas as for the answer, could you please type the missing words in the, um, in the chat? Uh-huh, all right, okay. All right, mm -hmm. so. Oops, uh, just a second. Let's see. Okay, and um, as you can see, yeah, all right, yes, Olga, thank you. So um, the important thing is that we should not uh, miss any words, right? So we have uh, crossed out a very um, friendly taxi driver, us, well, drove driven the same, but please do not miss into town, yeah? Right, uh, because the uh, then uh, the the answer uh, might not be considered as the correct one, like full 
uh, full and correct answer. So yeah, so uh, we were driven into town by a very friendly taxi driver. Yep, uh, so again, cross out the, uh, the same words mentioned in the original sentence. Um, looking at the uh, way the sentence starts and looking at the keyword, we can understand what drama is needed. Okay, the passive. By the way, uh, some of you mentioned that here we might use past perfect. Do you think it's a good idea to use here past perfect? Can we change the grammar of the original sentence in this case? Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, it's not a good idea. So here it's not justified. Uh, since we are given the past simple, uh, we are just turned the sentence into the passive. That's basically it. And uh, we, we keep the same grammar. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So that's, that's the idea. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions concerning use of English section? Yeah. So basically, uh, drawing your students' attention to, to, to these tiny, teeny little things uh, will be really valuable and, uh, and effective. And once they understand how, how things work, what to pay attention to, so they will, they will do their best, definitely. All right, good. Now, writing, another tricky um, part. And uh, talking uh, about writing, um, the important thing is to be familiar you personally and to familiarize your student with the criteria that the examiners use to evaluate the paper. Uh, because knowing the criteria, we will see if our task meets these standards or not. Our paper meets the standards or not. So what do examiners look at while they are evaluating the, the paper? So they look at the content, first of all. Uh, that's basically whether uh, you wrote what, what you were asked to. Um, so did you mention all the details in your essay which were covered in the task? Um, so did you mention some main points uh, or did you describe the pictures in your story and so on and so on? So that is the first thing we need. Our writing should match the task, all right? Uh, then the criterion that is called communicative achievement. And um, in this case, uh, we need to look at the style, whether you're writing too formal, too informal, or just right. So if that's the letter of complaint, it should be formal, but at the same time, it should not be aggressive. It should be polite because English is a very polite language. And uh, if that's a letter to your friend, again, it should be written uh, using the right style. Right? Okay, uh, there is a statement here, yes, with advanced learners, I draw the attention to the difference in the voice and mood when using the passive. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Right. So here we are talking about these uh, style conventions in most cases, right? Um, again, bearing in mind uh, who we are writing the letter to, yeah, and uh, whether all the formalities um, are used here. Then organization. Uh, paragraphs. So does your writing have paragraphs, basically? Do you link paragraphs to, and sentences? Do you, do you use linkers and linking words? Um, is, the, is what you have written is logical? Uh, is, this, is it a logical flow from start to finish, so to say? Right? If that's a letter, so there should be salutation, there should be introduction, and uh, there should be a part where you um, need some action from the address and so on and so on. Right. So that's also very important. And the language itself. Um, so that's the range of grammar and the range of vocabulary. Uh, so did you use some sparkling words or uh, is your lexis quite basic? Uh, did you, um, yeah, mistakes are crucial here. Spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, uh, and so on and so on. Yeah. So these are very important things. And once your students understand that, uh, what the examiners look at, they will be more aware uh, of uh, these points while they are writing, all right? Yeah, and some basically practical tips that we can use uh, to, um, to tell our students while they're doing. Um, so the first thing is, yeah, like I say to my students, well, basically doing anything, we need to read the question and the task carefully. We, we need to understand the important part, why? Remember about the criterion of content, uh, because we need to, uh, we should not miss anything important. And uh, very often students do not read attentively the task, 
And then what they write does not match the task and they go off topic and that's why they lose points. So first we need to analyze the task. Yeah. So what should we do here? Okay. That's an essay or that's a story or like there is a choice. Yeah. And uh, if that's an email, who am I writing to? Should I, should I use the formal, semi-formal or formal style and so on and so on. Right. So analysis comes first. Uh, then it's a good idea if you practice with your student making a plan. Yeah, referring to the question, um, looking at the uh, opportunities to develop the idea. Yeah, showing. Yeah, so um, brainstorming the ideas. First, come up with the ideas. So, and uh, you can you can discuss with the students. Uh, so, what could be the cases here? If that's the I don't know cause and solution essay uh, of let's say traffic jams. So you can uh, brainstorm the problems. Yeah, uh, that cause traffic jams, and then you can discuss the solutions, right? Uh, and then it's a good idea to see how they can develop these ideas, what supporting uh, details they can provide. Uh, and also at the um, moment of planning, they can also sort of plan the range of language they might use, right? Um, for example, they can think about certain linkers, like first of all, after that, on top of this, in conclusion, um, and so on right and uh if that's the letter okay uh, i can use the present continuous so i'm writing this letter or i haven't done something or if i describe a story then i need to think about narrative tenses yeah so it's a good idea if your students brainstorm uh what grammar they they can use and what kind of vocabulary they can use um if they know the topic let's say traffic jams so they might need some related vocabulary with that. Mm -hmm. So they can also brainstorm this kind of language and think uh, what they need to pay attention to. Uh, corrections, of course. Uh, so uh, it's a good idea if you teach your students to leave a couple of minutes at the end uh, to proofread uh, their work, or you can practice uh, peer proofreading. And uh, yeah, corrections can be allowed, but uh, the corrections should be clear so the examiners can follow uh, what's written and they can, uh, yeah, and if the corrections are clear, then the students, the, the candidates will not um, get a lower score for that. All right. Yeah. And um, another point, uh, yeah, that, that's also connected with the uh, planning. So your students should bear in mind and they should think carefully who their target reader is and uh, who they are writing to um, so that they um, apply the right style um, conventions and, and the right tone. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. OK, thank you, Anna. Um, all right. So good. So any questions as for the writing? So this is quite a broad uh, area. Uh, which might deserve another special webinar. But um, again, uh, getting back to the criteria, it's a good idea if you create uh, together with your students uh, or suggest your own checklist. And when uh, students do um, self-reflection uh, or self-check or you have peer check so that the students uh, read their partner's uh, papers so they can evaluate the paper across the criteria. Right. So, so did did the student write um, about what was asked? Yes. So, is the letter formal? Yes or no? It's semi-formal. Mistakes, vocabulary, basic or advanced, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, talking about the language, you may ask your student uh, to underline the uh, some um, let's say more sophisticated vocabulary that they have used. Or if you would like to draw their attention to the lingers, you may ask them, okay. Uh, while writing, underline the linkers that you're using. So that's also a good point. Or underline some uh, more complex grammar than just past simple, or, or underline all narrative tenses that you used in your story, in the story it's about the past. So you can, you can apply these elements, and in such a way you can uh, develop more awareness of what, what should be in the writing, and your students will have a better understanding uh, of uh, what, what can help them to get a better mark which criteria is affected when students write more than recommended uh to be honest um, that's a good question uh i'm not sure if that depends how how many words are extra um but in this case if uh let's say there are 10 or 15 words more uh 
uh, the students are not supposed to be punished for that. Of course, it's not a good idea to write 100 uh, or 200 words more because then the students are likely to make more mistakes there. But normally the students are not punished if there are some extra words in this case. Just the main thing is that they should not make more mistakes in this part of the text and their arguments uh, or the ideas uh, should be focused on what they are writing. Okay, but no, normally they're not punished for that. But again, this, uh, this excessive number should be reasonable, definitely. All right, okay, good. Any other questions concerning the writing section or maybe you have yeah, some questions concerning how to prepare your students to this? Okay, maybe not at the moment. All right. Okay, good. And um, yeah, a couple of other, uh, a couple of things that I would like to mention uh, about the like basically the importance of the exams and why we should encourage our students to take the exams. So these exams, uh, both B1 and B2, first are uh, officially recognized and uh, they provide the proven quality uh, among educational institutions worldwide. Uh, the exams um, are for a wide range of levels and skills. They are secure, reliable, and fair. And uh, this is also a way of upgrading um, English and uh, developing skills because this is the testing of all the skills. All right. Um, the use of idioms. Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, is it formal or not? Basically, like... Idioms, um, okay, uh, I would say phrasal words, but no, idioms, yeah, that depends. Uh, because uh, some of the idioms can be quite colloquial, let's say, um, and uh, the others could be um, quite advanced. So it all depends. So, it, I mean, the use of idioms is allowed uh, for exams, let's say for academic context in the essay, but they should be uh, formal ones. Again, the, uh, the same concerns phrasal verbs, they, they, they are maybe of both types. I mean, they can be uh, informal, for example, I know, catch up, catch up on somebody um, and uh, let's say look forward to, it's a phrasal verb, but it's uh, of a higher level, more formal. Our standardized test was mixed abilities. Fair, you mean fair, right? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I would say yes, why not? Uh, because uh, if I am a B1 student, but if I aim to take B2, let's say, exam, I should understand my chances. And um, so mm, I guess in this case, so anyway, the, they are objective, all the examiners and the invigilators, I don't know, and they are objective and they are trained to be objective and fair. Um, but again, that, that depends on the initial level. And um, uh, yeah, so each student, depending on the level, will, will, will get their mark, definitely, right? Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, and the final uh, words that I'd like to say, I really like this quote from Cambridge Assessment uh, English, is that learning English is more than just exam and grades, and it's about the confidence, yeah? And it's about uh, the fact that these like exam, exam preparation, taking exams can enrich our experience and opportunities, right? And uh, by encouraging our students to take exam and preparing them for exams, we can give them regular milestones to keep them motivated. And I'd like to get back uh, to the slide at the, in, uh, at the beginning. So it's a kind of journey. Uh, we show our students a journey and uh, we move on step by step uh, to um, a proficient level and we help them uh, to gain more um, confidence and uh, to develop their skills, language and providing them with more opportunities in life. All right, good. Okay, uh, basically that seems to be it uh, from me. Uh, if you have any other questions uh, connected was uh, differentiated instruction. Oh, thank you. That's a very good point. We will think about that differentiated instruction because that's really essential uh, because the, uh, there are always students of different abilities levels because we are all different as human beings. So thank you. That's a very good point. We will think about this um, kind of 
seminar or webinar or session or whatever. Right, perfect. Thank you. Any other questions that you would like to, to ask? Seems to be no. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your dedication, uh, your participation. Right. Thank you very much, yes. Liana, for your wonderful session full of tips and strategies for teachers. Now I'm sure they will not be afraid to prepare their students for exams and to take exams by themselves because we also run exam preparation courses and many teachers prepare to uh, take CAE and CPA exams with us. So uh, please, you are welcome uh, to enroll. As I promised to you uh, at the beginning of uh, this event, uh, I will tell you more about Great University and I'm ready to answer all your questions. Uh, to um, visit our website, great.university, and you can scan QR code, the code right now. And let me remind you of uh, what Great University is. So it's an online self-study platform. Uh, so does it mean that you study with a tutor or not? Okay, I can see uh, people uh, nodding their heads. Okay, so uh, actually um, it, it can be uh, accessed uh, via telephone or a tablet or a computer and uh, all the tasks are be, are be in such a way that <clears throat> you already can see the comments for correct and wrong answers. The feedback uh, from the tutors is already there. So you don't communicate with the tutors like, uh, real uh, persons, but it's already in the platform. Um, what you can do on the platform, so you can choose the courses, the short courses, and you can choose credentials, which are a bundle of courses, like four in one or three in one or five in one, depending on the area you uh, are interested in. Uh, we also um, so uh, there was a question about the dates and the schedule of the courses. It's a self-study platform, so there are no dates, uh, no deadlines. So you can enroll whenever you like, uh, day and night, and you can have access to the platform 24-7, uh, and you can, uh, you can proceed in the pace which is comfortable for you. Uh, if you would like to study 15 minutes a day, that's okay. If you would like to complete the course in, uh, in one day, that's also fine. It depends on uh, what type of learner you are. Um, let me remind you also that it's so easy to use our platform because you just have to register and um, you can immediately do the demo, which is in every course and it's absolutely free and <clears throat> you can immediately see what uh, the platform is and how uh, the tasks are built and if you like it or not and if you like it of course um, proceed, proceed to the next uh, units of the course. Um, right now uh, we are given a 50% discount for all the teachers uh, who <clears throat> access the platform uh, so please uh, don't forget to share this information with your colleagues because this discount is valid only uh, until the end of September so um, we have less than two months to try this um, uh, this opportunity and not to lose this chance. And what's more important, uh, all of our, our courses have a final test and based on the result of the final test, you will be issued a certificate. And there are two kinds of certificates and uh, they are also approved um, by the programs of the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine. So uh, you will have no problem if you uh, show up in the school and show this uh, certificate and uh, your school uh, will have to uh, consider it uh, as compulsory hours of your uh, training uh, as well. Uh, enjoy learning with uh, great university. Do you have any questions about the platform? I'm ready to answer them. Okay, yeah, we have, okay. Uh, where we can find the recording of the seminar, it will be available um, for you in the email on Monday, and you can also find it uh, at Grade University Video Library. It will be there, sure. So visit Grade University website. In a few days, uh, you will uh, be able to watch it there. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, payments through private 24, uh, yeah, mm, yeah we, we can pay with different banks and uh, <clears throat> actually it's Fondi uh, that we use for payment, 
uh, but uh, you can pay with uh, Apple Pay or with G Pay or whatever, or with Monobank, with, with whatever bank you use, with whatever uh, paying system you uh, you would like to use. Yeah, in one click only. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, the prices are in dollars because it's an international platforms. Uh, so make sure uh, what kind of conversion your bank uses, like because some banks in Ukraine, they use the double conversion and um, there might be an issue. So it's not the, the issue with the platform, it's the issue with the bank. Might you organize a session about assessment and evaluation? Of course. Um, visit our website, great.ua, and you will find all, all information about upcoming events there. I hope next week there will be all information about webinars and shops. And don't forget that in our video library at Great University, you can uh, access all the videos from the previous webinars and workshops. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Ex yeah, thank you very much for attending today's event. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, teachers. Thank you for inspiring us, actually, because we were inspired by you to create such a nice platform and a community of teachers who like developing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers, too. Yeah. Thank you, Lee, Dalena, and Oksana. Thank you, everyone. And I also want to uh, thank the great university team, uh, the course writers, the developers, the managers, the, the specialists who are working on the content of the, uh, of the platform. And uh, <clears throat> please go uh, register, try and enjoy learning with great university. See you at our upcoming events, everyone. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Are there any um, similar discounts for CPE courses? Please contact our office if you are interested in exam preparation or write at info at grade.ua. <clears throat> oh, thank you very much for such inspiring words. Thank you, teachers. Thank you. All right. Okay. See you at Great University. Bye bye, everyone, and have a nice evening. Bye bye. <laughs>